but you're eligible at the next meeting I, I might point out something not a red flag but I just might point out a couple of things to council that they might want to be aware of it, while they're making those kinds of decisions um, in regards to sending the money out we send it out by the uh, last day of March of each year um, and the in-kind contributions, they get a, a letter letting you know that you've uh, got some discounted rent or free free meeting space. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Ms. Monteith. At this point in the agenda, the grant in aid and in-kind contribution applicants will have an opportunity to present their applications. Please limit your presentation to five minutes. Maybe Chris will have a little bit more. Yeah. <laughs> Every time. If you plan to present by Zoom, please raise your hand when I call on your organization. The first listed applicant is Euclid Aquarium Society, is a representative in attendance. Excellent. Please uh, go to the lectern and is make sure the mic is turned on. There we go. Hello. There you go. All Perfect. Right. Okay. Just your name and um, and go for it. Perfect. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mayor McEwen, uh, honorable council members, and the rest of the public. My name is Jessica and I am here representing the Euclid Aquarium today. On behalf of the Euclid Aquarium, I would like to acknowledge that we work, play, live and learn on the traditional territories of the Chalnath Nations, which include the Euclidath Nation, the Toqua Nation and the Tlaquat First Nations. We are asking the District of Euclid for a total of $6,330 to build a display of two marine mammal skeletons with the assistance of a local bone expert, Albert Shepard. We would like to display a skeleton of a white-sided dolphin and another of a doll's purpose, which will be cleaned, articulated, assembled, and suspended from the ceiling of the aquarium. Seeing a, co a complete skeleton of a dolphin and a porpoise side by side and in person will give folks a new appreciation for the size and power of these animals. The mission statement of the aquarium is to promote respect and education for local marine environments. By supporting this project, we will be able to expand our education to the 40,000 plus visitors a year that will now include marine mammals. A display about marine mammals allows us to showcase a visual representation of the connection between coastal waters and the open ocean. It also broadens our interest base by having displays of charismatic megafauna that the public can relate to. Dolphins of purposes are favorites with the public, which means that we can invite more conversations about conservation and being good stewards of our co oceans and coastlines um, by displaying these mammal skeletons. People are more incentivized to make changes if conservation efforts impact an animal that they care about, like a dolphin. Dolphins of purposes are apex predators, which like tooth whales means that they can be exposed to compounds that can bioaccumulate in their tissues. This is just an example of the types of discussions a marine mammal display can generate. This is a unique opportunity for our volunteers as well to learn from an expert through workshops and preparing and displaying animal bones. It would also allow for our community to gather for the unveiling of a new display, something that we know the community has missed throughout the pandemic. This would be a really special experience to have as a permanent exhibit, something that no other organization in this area is offering. Euclid is a community tethered to the sea, which relies on healthy ecosystems to support the cultural, economic, social, and physical well-being of the people and animals that live here. Our hope is that by expanding the educational experience that here in, to include marine mammals along with fish and invertebrates, we will inspire visitors and locals alike to minimize their impacts on the coastal ecosystem. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Does council have any questions? Councillor Hoare? I'm just curious, Jessica. Um, the two skeletons, are they animals that were washed up, like beached, or like do you already have the 
we do already have yeah. the skeletons. Yeah. <laughs> they I were just assumed buried in our curator's backyard for a while. They oh, were, yeah. I think they came from the DFO. Yeah. And they would have been, <laughs> I mean, yeah. Um, so the best so thing they, you can do is bury them and let the dermestids have at it. <laughs> exactly. It's, that's what you do. Exactly. Like, so we do already be buried have in my them. backyard if I had earth. <laughs> yeah. We just need um, the funds to help um, Albert with the materials and his time mm -hmm. um, to be able to help get this project off the ground literally off the ground <laughs> and the ceiling. <laughs> um, other part of this question is, um, so you'll do the articulation with volunteers. Will public be allowed to be involved in that or just watch it from? There would be a limited invitation to the public to mm -hmm. be involved. Um, we do have a volunteer base already. We would obviously give them the opportunity as well to be included, but it wouldn't be hundreds of people, for example, but hopefully... A handful. I'm just saying it's such a great teaching opportunity yeah. to actually articulate a skeleton like that. Yeah. So, and then so perhaps, you know, video school. recording. Yeah, exactly. To be able to have, yeah, that kind of involvement. Great questions, Councillor Hoare. I met uh, Albert Shepard years ago uh, at the Whale Festival. He was involved with the Build-A-Whale that um, Strawberry Island has right now. Um, and is he still involved with that build a whale project or does Strawberry Island sort of take over that? I actually don't know if he is involved anymore. He definitely has had a hand with Strawberry Island for sure and he consults I think for other folks as well. Um, I know he's done projects out in Souk uh, for articulation but you know for this area of the coastline, this part of the world, um, that would be, it would be a special project to have as a permanent display rather than like a touring display like the Build-A-Whale. I know the Build-A-Whale is hugely popular. Yeah, And exactly. uh, yeah, a great learning tool for, for kids especially. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? No? Okay, thank you for your presentation. Thank you. The next applicant is the Euclid and Area Child Care Society. Welcome, Kathy. Thank you. I'm so excited to be second. We're usually at the end. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, here we are. Take care, society. So just running through our quick numbers, which is what I like to try to do with you guys each year. Our multi-age program is running with eight registrations. The group daycare has 28 current registrations. And, and the after school program and the like out of school care is running with 22 registrations. So that's just like how many families are registered in each category. With regards to our actual numbers on a daily basis, the multi-age program runs with about six, sometimes eight kids per day. Uh, the group daycare is 18 to 24 kids per day. And the after school, our out of school care program is running between 12 and 14. So compared to last year, our um, after school and out of school care program numbers have dropped because we've left the UAC hall and moved back into our facility space here. Um, staffing wise, we only have eight staff currently on the daycare board, or I mean within the team. We're definitely struggling. I think this will be a common theme for everybody in town. We're definitely struggling with finding staffing um, and just doing our best. So we've got two ECEs, three ECE assistants, two responsible adults, and one floor assist. We have been advertising for about eight months and just like every daycare on the coast, everybody's short staffed. Um, we did have an opportunity to kind of partner out with Sprotshock College, and so six locals have started the ECE program in October, and we'll finish it this August, and we're supporting them through our center to do their practicums, um, and hopefully they'll come and work for us, but ideally, this is another six local people that have housing that will be coming out with um, either ECEs um, in September to help address the child care shortage we're seeing. Now, this shortage isn't just you kill it. This is a bigger issue. Like, we all know what child care shortages look like for the community. Um, and really, we are heat. I just want to say thank you. Our heating's not been an issue. Like, I have to just say how much perseverance 
that honestly the district staff, front staff here and Abby have shown with trying to solve it and it's just been really a treat and I just want to say thank you for how much everybody has done and the communication that was happening with us. Little heaters, com staff coming in on weekends, district staff coming in on weekends and preheating our space till they got things ironed out. It was really, really appreciated and very, very supportive and we just want to say thank you. I don't know what we would do without Barb and Judy and Mary letting us come in to watch a movie when we're frazzled and need somewhere to take the kids or letting us go into the gym and play. So to have your support here is really, really, really important. Thank you. And the last thing I just want to speak about is our new spaces grant. Um, I do have my building permits now, as most of you will know. So we'll be starting our renovations on the chamber space. The idea is to open up at least nine infant toddler spots. If we can bump that to 12, it, we will. We just have to wait to see what our spacing sets out like once we do our renovations. And childcare fees. As of November 1st, you were paying uh, 40, what was our, 49.34 a day. And as of December 1st, because of the government grants, parents are now paying 21.84 a day, okay? So 27.50 a day is being covered by a grant now for every kid in uh, the three to five year old, or under five, zero to five year old age group. And come September with the next set of funding that we see come through, that's how we'll see this $10 a day concept come in. So our families for full-time daycare right now are paying about $440, um, which was over 900 a few months ago. And by September, that'll be coming down to $200 a day. So it's, there is a lot of exciting stuff. It's just that investment and waiting to get the trained staff and that kind of thing. And that's all I have to say. Great. Thank you, Kathy. Any questions from Council? Councillor Hoare? Just curious, Kathy, any <coughs> idea how long the rentals will take on the chamber space? We really only have a couple weeks worth of rentals. Okay. It's right. going to come back to staffing it. And does anybody have a basement? We can hire some staff and put them in. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, and I think like this is, I mean, as I would like to think that probably all the nonprofits are feeling the same pressure as I am of not being able to hire. And this is a community issue that we're looking at. I know this has been front and center for years, but this is the harsh reality. It's like when you're working a job where you make 20 to $22 an hour, you can't afford $3,000 a month for rent. And so there's not, it's, there's just no way to attract people into the field right now. The, the newest people that I've hired, they usually tend to be the people here from coming here from Quebec that only want to stay for six months. And um, we're just not seeing those people moving here that want to come into the field and stay in the field. But that's a bigger issue, not a UQLIT issue. Great, thank you. Any other questions from council? No? Um, thank you for your presentation. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thanks for letting me know, too. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. <laughs> the West Coast Community Resource Society is next. Welcome. Hi, Carrie. And just your name, please. Yeah. Um, Mayor and Council, happy to be here. My name is Lori Hanna, and I'm the new Executive Director for the West Coast Community Resources Society. This is my day seven. <laughs> Very excited to be here. Um, and uh, yeah, we, as you know, service uh, the whole region, 6,000 people, including to the District of Tofino, District of Municipality, and the Five Nations, Tatsu, uh, Tokorit, Klaukwiat, Heshkwit, and Hausen. If you could just speak up a little bit, please. Yeah, okay. I'm gonna just this. So, um, our mission is to provide responsive, safe, and supportive services to individuals and families while supporting the right to explore options and make choices in all areas of their lives. We are committed to ending all forms of abuse, including systemic power imbalances and family violence. In partnership with other services and resources, we promote the equity, diversity, and well-being of all people on the West Coast communities. Um, our programs include Transition House, Second Stage Supportive Housing, Women's Counseling, Women's Outreach, uh, Community Outreach, Community Support for Children and Adults and with Special Needs, and a number of Child and Youth Counseling for those who are impacted by violence, substance use, or others at risk. Um, 
yeah, our organization serves um, members of the West Coast, everyone who visits our hub and office and attends our holiday lunch, most of whom are affected um, by violence, disadvantaged, or marginalized. So today, we're asking for in-kind donation of $5,750. So we uh, respectfully request an in-kind donation of 5000 to reduce our monthly rent in the UCC hub area. This allows us the flexibility to respond to changing needs quickly and adapt our services delivery accordingly. Um, we also look forward to continuing to continuing to host our annual holiday luncheon in mid-December in accordance with the public health orders. We're rec requesting an in-kind donation for the use of the main hall on the day and of the of the event and use the kitchen for four days leading up to and including the event. The estimated cost for this rental waiver fee is approximately $750. Um, and this year we really had a successful one over the years I guess it's just growing and growing. This year we had about 160 people come and um, yeah it was really enjoyed by all so yeah is there any questions from mayor and council questions from council i see um it's up by 750 this year but that's because um you didn't ask for the the use like the waiving of the fee of the hall for the community lunch before oh right yeah yeah so yeah Way to go, Carrie. <laughs> <laughs> Great. And um, welcome to your new job, Laurie. Thank you very much. Yeah, I saw yeah. the press release that uh, Carrie sent out, so it's great to have you. Yeah, I'm excited to be here. Yeah, it's lovely. I've gotten to work with Margaret over the years as well, so it's a really nice kind of, yeah, kind of continuing of relationships and well, big familiarity shoes. with lots B of people. Big shoes to fill, that's for sure. Definitely. For yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, welcome again. Thanks so much, And everyone. thanks for your presentation. Yeah, thanks, everyone. <coughs> Here we go. The next presentation is by the Food Bank on the Edge. <laughs> welcome, Chris. <laughs> Hi, good afternoon, everybody, mayor and council members. Thank you for coming in person. This is great. So excited. So I'm Chris Martin. I'm with the Food Bank on the Edge Society. Um, our 2022 grant and aid uh, donation was used to continue to purchase fresh produce for our clients. So we get a, a twice a week donation from the co-op of produce that is outgoing, but the funds enabled us to buy every week our staple produce, which is potatoes, onions, and carrots. So we really appreciate being able to give first quality produce to our clients. <coughs> this past May, uh, the Food Banks BC held their annual or biannual uh, conference for the first time in four years because of COVID. And we had five of our directors in attendance, which was awesome because uh, we everybody gets jazzed and excited and you know comes back with a lot of new energy so we were very thrilled that so many of us could go um, during the year we continue to partner in the community with the West Coast Community Resources Society um, we help out with their community lunch they still um, help us with outreach delivery every Tuesday to Tofino and Euclid and any of the uh, to Fino side indigenous communities uh, that when we need hampers delivered. We also have partnered over the years with Tofino Fish and Loaves. Uh, the Euclid Daycare um, is one of our partners as well. When we have a surplus of items that we can share with the daycare, I contact Kathy and so we spread the love around there. Also the co-op is also one of our community partners as well as for, uh, Forest Glen, the Seaview Senior Society. So whenever we can, we get we still get our grants. Well, we had last year we got grants to continue to buy food for our clients. We also got a lot of donations from our hub in Nanaimo, the Nanaimo Loaves and Fishes, and it's a clearinghouse for incoming food donations from across well BC and Canada. We had a successful holiday season. Our stuff, the cruiser, is still a uh, very um, popular. Uh, kick off to the holiday season. 
um, the co-op, the advent calendar that Councillor Hoar um, spearheads is always a fun time for us to get donated items that we don't always go out and buy. Also, we had uh, our Christmas hamper this year was uh, we gave out 104 hampers and it was it fed over 300 people this year. So we had another successful Christmas hamper. We did encounter um, a price increases. So we sort of anticipated that and budgeted accordingly. And fortunately, we did it. We did great. Um, we had during the summer, we, it was unusual this summer, because our numbers over COVID kind of fluctuated a lot. However, from May to September, we had almost a 30% increase in client visits. And one of the main areas of this increase was our um, seasonal workers that came into the community. So we had a big influx, and in especially July and August, it really was um, a challenge to keep up with the food demands that we were every week trying to handle. Uh, I wanted to also, um, well, let me lead into this with my um, statement that I, at the time when I did the, in kind, the um, grant and aid application, we asked for the $2,000 grant as well as an in-kind contribution of the use of the rec hall, no, yes, the um, seaplane based rec hall for our Christmas hamper. And this year, because of our website development, which our director, Bree Walker, helped us so much on that, we had so many donations come in that for this year, we would like to withdraw our request for the monetary part of our grant and aid. And it sounds like there's other societies that can use it more than us. And But we would like to retain the in-kind contribution of using the rec hall for two days in December um, for our Christmas hamper. So it's usually around the 21st or 22nd, um, and that's been very helpful to use that building. Um, I think that's all of my report. At this time, I would like to bring one of my, my directors, one of my newer directors, Mako, to give a brief update on our building project. I think we have one minute left. So okay. Perfect. perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Yeah, and, I, and, and thanks, Chris. And I think that everybody knows how supportive and how important the food bank on the edges in Uculet. Something we've been talking about for, for many years is, re, is a building replacement. And uh, one of the things I was unable to uh, kind of get uh, done in my previous term. So I just want to give you guys a full of foreshadowing here. I'll be cornering each of you in the next uh, coming weeks here. Uh, we do have our building plans. And uh, we're just getting some final numbers now on the cost of that. And uh, we're hoping that uh, the district will be able to be a partner uh, with our replacement that we hope to have by this time next year. Thanks, Mako. Are you still looking at Tugwell Field as the location? We would like to, but I know that we'll have to work with the planning department and staff about the, the options. And then uh, the questions to you uh, in general will be the location and um, how much you're willing to contribute to the cause. Any questions from council for Mako? Thanks, you guys. Okay, Appreciate thanks it. for your presentation. And Chris, I heard that the rec hall was super cold that when you were doing the Christmas hampers. Well, it, it works, though. We have, you know, I mean, the heater runs, and it's, there's a lot of bodies in there. We're all moving around a lot, so I don't think any of us suffered that much. <laughs> okay, that's good to know. Thanks. <laughs> thanks. Now is an opportunity for the Pacific Rim Hospice Society to present. Is there a representative here or on, on Zoom? That'd be Tarney, probably. I'm here. Can you hear me? <laughs> yes, we can hear you. Hey, there I am. There you are. Hello. Thank you for having me today. Um, uh, congratulations on your recent election. We're happy to be here presenting for the Pacific Rim Hospice Society. Our um, our ask today is four thousand um, dollars. The council has been very generous over the last several years to provide us with four thousand dollars each year. Uh, this year we ask again for the same amount to pay for our registered clinical counselor Tara Such, who is new to it. Um, 
that's our ask today. So the purpose of Pacific Rim Hospice Society is to enhance the quality of life for individuals and families in the Pacific Rim region during illness, injury, death, and grief through education and compassionate care. So we provide grief and loss counseling and support to children, youth, and adults. We provide grief groups to youth and adults. We support individuals who are dying and their families. And we also, um, this past year, have been uh, facilitating the Better at Home program on the West Coast, which is non-medical home supports for older adults to stay at home longer. So transportation, medical appointments, health appointments, light house cleaning, friendly visiting, so keeping people co company um, throughout their lives. Uh, so specifically today, what we're asking for is we're inviting your support to uh, cover wages for our registered clinical counselor. It's um, great to have Tara on board as a counselor, as opposed to, you know, we have about 20 volunteers providing grief support, but the counseling piece is, is really great to have someone of her caliber on our staff. Uh, so she would provide counseling to youth, children and youth and young adults up to 30. She also provides support for adults, older adults with complex grief as well. Um, so we're estimating she would see 60 to 100 people on the West Coast. Uh, she will support the school staff as well and other um, folks in the community, service providers who oftentimes need some consultation about clients who are grieving or going through some things. She will also support um, uh, her peer mentor program, which is a six week program. We work in partnership with the District of Eucalypt's Recreation Department um, in providing um, its life skills for youth, uh, learning how to um, help their peers who are going through grief, whether it's grief from a death or grief from a parent separation or uh, friend issues. So it's sort of a, a general life skills program that's been really uh, popular. So we will do that again this year, uh, this spring. And um, and yeah, I think that's, I'll, I'll, um, I'll keep it nice and brief, but that's what we're, we're inviting you to support this year. And thank you very much for your time today. Thank you, Tarni. Um, how is the Better at Home program going? Do you have a lot of uptake with that? Yes, the, the program is going fabulously, actually. We have, we currently have 48 clients, last, last meeting that we had. Um, all throughout uh, the West Coast, Tofino, Ukluit, Hitatsu, uh, Tayastanis, Esawista, um, a nice spread out load. We have Panyota Pan is our uh, program coordinator, and she has been very busy, uh, you know, trying to get house cleaners on board. We've had some challenges along the way because everyone's so busy out here on the coast with vacation rental cleaning, but we do have one woman from Ukluit, Kath Katharina. She has been amazing. We have a volunteer driver in Euclid as well, and we've recently um, signed on with Kabu to provide some uh, rides for folks in Euclid and um, area, you know, who, who want to go to health appointments, medical appointments, and what have you. So, yeah, it's going really well, you know. Uh, yeah, thank you. And thanks for helping out on the transportation action table as well, tr trying to solve our transportation issues here. That's yeah. great to have you on that committee as well. Any questions from Council? Councillor Hoare? Just a quick one, Tarni. Um, the Youth Peer Mentorship Program, has there been good uptake? I'm just curious how many peeps have been taking that program? Because I know you've run it for, is it two years now? It's probably going on the third year. Um, interesting, so I looked at our, we, I haven't collated all our 22, 2022 stats yet, but uh, 2021 we had nine participants in the Peer Mentorship Program. We did run it twice that year. Uh, this uh, fall, we didn't have a lot. We didn't have enough participants to run it, so we postponed it till this coming spring. Um, but you know, COVID and a few other things. But generally speaking, it's had some pretty good uptake. I think uh, we can also advertise it a bit better, and you know, uh, perhaps even more to the homeschooler community and other other youth around as well who might not be attending high school. But yeah, pretty good. Great. Any other questions? You guys are quiet today, my goodness. <laughs> okay, thanks, Tarni, for your presentation. Thank you all very much. Uh, next is an opportunity for the Pacific Rim Rotary Club to present. And I understand there is a representative 
in attendance on Zoom. Mr. Rotenberg. Yes, Rotary. Good afternoon, can everyone hear me? Yes, we can. Good afternoon and thank you for the opportunity, Mayor and Council. My name is Lori Gerke, I'm the current president of the uh, Pacific Rim Rotary Club, formerly the, the Ukulet Rotary Club. We have grown in size considerably over the last couple of years and we are looking forward to some future growth as well. Our organization is a service organization and we are here to serve our community in developing projects and events that benefit the residents and promote the ideals of Rotary in giving humanitarian services, promoting goodwill and upholding high standards and ethics. We have participated in many programs throughout the last couple of years, which include things like we work in conjunction with the district for Pumpkins in the Mist. We are in the process of developing a Frisbee golf course. Uh, we have both in, both in partnership with the Recreation Department. We volunteer throughout the community at events like the Soapbox Derby, Yuki Days. We work in conjunction with the Surfrider Group for Earth Week community cleanups beach cleans. Um, we have, we are opening up, a, beginning to work a program called RILA, which is for youth service. We are also working on updating and maintaining our mini libraries that we have throughout the community. We right now have 24 members and as I mentioned, we're growing. And the residents and visitors to Ukula benefit from our activities in the community, um, as well as other nonprofits such as the food bank. We volunteer with them at the hamper time for deliveries and so on. Um, this year, we are requesting an in-kind contribution by ha asking the district to provide a meeting space for our club at the UCC. We like to meet on the second Wednesday evening of each month for about an hour. Our current board of directors meet there once a month, as I mentioned, and once a month we have a social gathering for our club members and anyone that's interested in what we do in the community and how we can grow. Um, a regular meeting space continues to add stability to our club and it doesn't tax our funds that we've raised to pay for a meeting space. Our goal is to utilize 100% of our fundraising efforts to go towards service projects and as a nonprofit, this in-kind contribution would be of great service to us. We certainly appreciate the support we have received in the past from the district and look forward to maintaining that assistance in the future. Thank you, Laurie. Any questions from Council? No? Uh, I know you were going to give us an update on the Chamber of Commerce, but I think we're going to invite you to another meeting to do that, if that's okay. Yes, that would be fine. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Laurie. Thank you. Uh, Strawberry Isle Marine Research Society now has an opportunity to present. Is a representative here? If not, I think Carissa would be on Zoom. I believe there's a Sophie um, Vanderbank on Zoom who's available to answer any council questions if they have any. <laughs> Wrong one. <laughs> So, um, Sophie, you've been uh, unmuted. Oh, oh hello. Um, hi to the council and the mayor and uh, all of the attendees. Um, I am here on behalf of Strawberry Isle Marine Research Society. Um, unfortunately, I haven't been able to prepare a presentation, um, but I can answer any questions um, about our, our grants and application. Um, and we are requesting an in-kind contribution to provide our Build a Whale program to our community as a free and accessible resource. So it's just an in-kind donation you're looking for this year? Yes, uh, we have requested uh, 2,500 um, to help uh, run our program uh, through the summer monthly. Uh, in partnership with the Wild Pacific Trail. 
uh, as well as other uh, five to ten community events um, just to make this program accessible to our local community. Um, I was unable to pre uh, prepare a presentation because I'm actually on the road right now with our Build the Whale program in Squamish uh, for an elementary school here. So we'd uh, like to provide that opportunity just to our community as well. Um, so how far afield do you take the Build a Whale? Uh, so I have, we have almost traveled to Alberta. Um, and uh, this summer we're hoping to go to Prince Rupert. We've had some interest there. So mostly BC at the moment, but yeah, she's traveled quite far for an offshore orca. <laughs> 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 That's great. And so the, um, when you take the whale to a community, is it free for people to attend the, um, I, I assume you dismantle her and put her back together again? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so that is the thing, um, as it is an educational program, um, and just to cover sort of our staff time and the transport costs, um, we do charge schools a fee for rental of the Build-A-Whale and for our Build-A-Whale program. Um, and that's sort of what we're looking for out of out of the money that we've requested is to fund um, us in being able to provide that as a free resource in Tofino and Ukulit. Um, we did that last summer and uh, had it at Tourism Tofino and on the Wild Pacific Trail. So we're hoping that uh, this money will allow us to do it again this summer and people won't have to pay to see our and participate in our Build a Whale program. Does she have a name? Uh, yeah, she does. It's it's not the most exciting name. It's O120. Uh, so yeah, O for offshore, and then the sort of scientific numbering system. But I'm tr I'm I'm definitely in favor of a of a more common name. So if anyone has any ideas? <laughs> That's great. Any questions from council? Um, Councillor Mafti. Yeah, through the mayor. I'm I I'm just trying to understand the, the ask here for the community events. These are specific to community events in Tofino and Euclid or uh, remote communities that would presumably be further afield as well. Like how many events in Euclid are you looking to support with this ask? Oh yeah, absolutely. Sorry about the confusion there. The, the remote events are, would be separate from this ask. The ask is solely for local events. Um, and that would be uh, five to 10 events through the summer depending on the amount, and, and that would be sort of ideally a monthly event in Euclid on the Wild Pacific Trail, um, as well as a monthly event in Tofino, making up 10 throughout the summer. And that would sort of just cover staff time. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Hoare. <laughs> uh, I propose that it be all of 120. Um, yeah. The only O name I can come up with off the top of my head. Um, but I, I'm just wondering if you guys are going to be doing the build a whale with the um, the whale fest, the Pacific, the in March. Is that going to be one of your events? Absolutely, yeah. Um, so I think we've already been scheduled for two days um, to be be available uh, to sort of the public and youth with that program for the whale fest this year. Yeah, we'll be there. And great name idea. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. If there's no further questions, thank you for your um, answers to our questions, Sophie. Thank you very much for your time. Next up is the Euclid and Area Historical Society. Welcome, Barb. Hello, Mayor and Council. Thanks very much for this opportunity today. We're just asking for our general in-kind donation of facility usage here at the Community Centre for our monthly meetings, the UAC Hall for our annual Mother Day plant sale. And hopefully this summer, depending on um, bookings, um, a, mi a mini pop-up museum. We looked at doing this in 2020, um, but then it was rented out, of course, to another facility or another group, shall we say. So we're looking to try and bring that back um, on a short term, like three days a week, four hours, 
with some um, local assistance from our volunteer based and yeah, so that would be our request for this year thanks where where do you get the pop-up museum from we've been create we're starting to create our own like yeah just creating our own displays and then perch like ordering them so it would just be like something pop you know how something pops up and then we'll have artifacts and stuff depending on the display one will also be like tv based right so you can watch watch a series awesome questions from council any progress with the museum? Ah. <laughs> Loaded question, sorry. Okay. Blink, Let's blink. We'll skip that one. <laughs> I just know I that. Know. The Is there? Can you tell me anything? The the yeah. <laughs> Back at you. Uh, I, I know news? society members have uh, so many artifacts in their, their basements that uh, it would be a nice to have a place to put them on display one day. Some more storage for sure. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Okay, no other question. Oh, Councillor Hoare. I'm super excited about the idea of a mobile museum. Yeah. Just saying. Um, and uh, I plan to be the first person in line at the Mother's Day <laughs> plant sale as per <laughs> usual. Yes. Per <laughs> gotta, yes. Get, gotta get those okay. tomatoes. Yeah. 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 yeah, so everybody can <laughs> start their seedlings now for your donations to our, um, our plant sale, please. And talk to me <laughs> if you need plants, uh, uh, plant pots. Pots. Because I definitely have the larger pots that my flowers come in at work. So. Perfect. Okay. Thanks very much. Thank you, Barb. Now is an opportunity for the Junior Canadian Rangers to present. Is there a representative here? If not, is there one on Zoom, Mr. Rotenberg? I do not see the Junior Rangers on Zoom. I think it would be Bernie Herbert if if she was on. Yeah, I spoke with Bernie. I did. I, did, I don't see her on Zoom at this point. Okay, we'll move on, and if she pops up, let us know. Uh, next is Seaview Seniors Housing Society and Forest Glen. Sat over there. <laughs> Welcome, Kathy. Um, um, for the newer people on, on um, council, um, who I've known maybe but not met, I'm Kathy Whitcomb. Um, I'm the administrator at Forest Glen Seaview Seniors Housing Society, and uh, gosh, going on five years now, I think. Um, it's been quite um, uh, a, a five years for Forest Glen because being the um, administrator for 10 um, vulnerable seniors to get through COVID and whatnot. It's been quite a ride and we've had to change a lot of things. We've had to forego many things and we're ready now to get back on track. Um, my um, several members of the board are here as well. Very uh, supportive working board. Uh, the, um, the, the, the administration and one part-time um, maintenance are what make up the staff at Forest Glen. Um, we have contract workers. Other than that, we have two chefs for the dining, which is included in their program, and um, cleaning, and uh, and then you know whatever else we need in terms of, of uh, maintenance and whatnot. So it's a really small. We're a really small staff. And um, it's subsidized by BC Housing and Island Health. So we service both independent living people and assisted living. We are not a medical facility, but um, we are a community um, society that depends on a lot of volunteers and um, in making sure that the safety and security is in place at all times for those seniors. Um, our ask, um, has been well our, our what our goal is is uh the seniors volunteering with seniors and those of you who have been involved with that program know how incredibly successful more than we could have ever imagined um to host once a month luncheons for the seniors in the community 
And uh, we started out with about, I think in the early days, it was in conjunction with the West Coast Resource Society, started out with about 20 people coming into our lovely, lovely common room. Uh, and it grew to 65 people um, at most and, um, you know, 50 to 60 at all times. So it, it's really proven itself over the years to be a very, very um, good event for seniors socializing. Um, their, their support, their support healthy um, living and socialization and uh, post COVID pandemic, it's, it's going to be a real startup again. So we want to provide a dependable hub for seniors who wish to be a part of Forest Glen and events and luncheons. And fortunately, we have reached the point now where we've been able to reinstate um, the Sunshine Club, which is a group of people who get together to play cards and have s snacks and laugh a lot and uh, everything from dominoes to bad jokes, you know. Um, <laughs> and uh, some of the people who come are people who are in the medical um, island health. They come and join in, the paramedic uh, head comes in, and they join them and, and help that socialization and help them get around and things like that. Um, Forest Glen um, provides the venue to, and, and would pl we want to get the luncheons back on track. So Forest Glen provides the, ve the venue and then through the community, you know, we advertise throughout our friends and family um, mailing list. Um, we have volunteers that have been so amazing over the years, again, including the, the healthcare workers. Um, we do speakers and guest chefs, and we do this just amazing thing on once a month on Wednesdays. So what, last year we passed on um, at an ask because we knew we couldn't go forward right then. So um, this year we'd like to go back to our original ask, which is $3,500. We also can include with that any time, and we've done this in previous years, if there's an organization, um, whether it's the rec department or um, a, a viable organization that would be um, in sync with what we can provide, we would, um, we would definitely uh, consider the space. We have a boardroom and we have a large dining room area that's also a common room with, with games and a pool table and, and, and whatnot. So we want to include the community as much as we can. Um, the seniors, um, the past programs have really proven themselves to be something that's a benefit to the senior communities. And we even get people from um, at the luncheons from Tofino or we did in, in that time. Um, so that in kind of reverse in-kind thing um, is something that we would definitely um, be on board for if we, if we can, if, if, if it fits into our, our, our program. Um, so the other things that we did um, during that time where we were able to have events is we had um, chair yoga by yours truly, Chris Martin. <laughs> Who sweats um, and, <laughs> and yo, uh, cribbage and whatnot. So, and one of the things we do more than anything there is we laugh. You know, we just we have to make it a good time for all. Um, so that's what we're asking for. Um, we would like to start rebooting it in the early spring and then get it back on track um, as we go. We will have to um, find other other means of, of support as well financially, which we um, will be looking at. Um, being such a small staff, it's kind of the working board is, is one that gets some delegation <laughs> throughout. And we really, really appreciate them. And we appreciate our relationships with the food bank, with um, Tofino and Yukula Culinary Guild, uh, to the co-op, to the chefs who came in for the year during COVID that we could not supply a, a, a chef. So we had um, worked with the community, the restaurants, the various restaurants and whatnot to actually prepare meals for us. We would go pick up and deliver to the apartments of the seniors. So it's been an all-inclusive um, effort to make things um, go. And I am pleased to say that throughout the entire time we had one 
COVID case, which we're very proud of. So that is our ask. I thank you very much for having us here. Appreciate what you've done in the past, and we hope to do more in the future. Thank you very much. Thanks, Kathy. Do you want to wait for questions? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I just have to say this is a very different conversation from the last three years when you were just trying to keep these people alive, basically. And it's very uplifting to see the progress that we're making. Yeah, yeah. It's and we couldn't do it without, I have to say, we could not do it without the community health care workers. And um, we're always, like most people with staff, we have been short of care workers to where everyone has to pitch in for everyone and making it happen. Right. Uh, any questions from council? Uh, I recall that you had a couple of food trucks come in from time to time to do We a, did. Yeah. We had um, about jiggers. twice a year, Jiggers would bring the truck to Forest Glen, and we would do it in the summer, and they would pull up and plug in the generator and, and, and just go for it. Everybody got to come up the window and they had their you know they could pick whatever they wanted it was amazing That's and they awesome. um they, they were just it was it was just an example of what you cool it does yeah. really yeah yeah so oh, that's wonderful anyway, and i invite any of you who haven't been there i invite you to come over and have a look um see what what it looks like in there and and, and uh kind of what we do so yeah are you fully subscribed right now? Do you have yes. 10? Yeah. We don't have any, um, any holes. <laughs> Great. OK, thank you, Kathy. <coughs> Anybody else? And thanks to the board for coming with me, the support staff. <laughs> thanks for coming. I just want to say, Kathy, I'm super excited that the Sunshine Club is back for everybody, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, pretty much, right? Uh, okay, Surfrider Pacific Rim now has an opportunity to present their application. There's probably nobody in attendance. Is someone on Zoom, Mr. Rotenberg? No hands raised on Zoom, and I do not see the Surfrider Foundation listed. Okay, sure. Welcome. Come on back. Hi, Mayor and Council. It's Lori Hanna. I'm the past chapter coordinator for Surfrider Pacific Rim. Recently passed, like over a week ago. So <laughs> I, it's, there's just never any time, right? This is like one thing to another. We're all short staff, right? <laughs> so anyways, um, I'm still volunteering with them. I'm going to be doing their ocean friendly business for the next couple of months. So still involved on a volunteer basis. And you know, it's it's an organization. Their mission is the protection of the ocean beaches and ways for everyone to enjoy through a powerful activist network. So hence, I'm in a volunteer role now. Um, this application was for supporting um, their beach cleanup. And so my coworker Sophie is not here today, but I would just advocate for those funds. Um, there's a lot of collaboration we did. We did a lot of collaboration over Earth Day last year in doing a community um, pop-up reuse it cafe. And it was the first year that we actually collaborated to do the whole mop cleanup. So it was like from Tofino right to Yakulet. And uh, yeah, I think that was it. Just really wanting some supports to continue on the Love Your Beach program. They have like since gone down to one staff due to funding restrictions and everything. So this was just to continue some of those supports. So I'm just really advocating for that organization that now I'm volunteering with. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Lori. Any questions from council? Councillor Hoare? Um, you may not have the answer to this one, Lori, but mm -hmm. I notice in the letter that they, they're asking for in-kind for some community space use for the Earth Day as well, but that's not included in the summary, but I'm wondering if that's because it's not, they're not using like the hall, they're asking for like the seaplane base parking lot and stuff, so because that's not a renting space. Okay, sorry. The question was more to <laughs> okay, getting a nod from the director of finance there. <laughs> 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 Just 
clarifying for myself. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Yes. I mean, last year we had a great collaboration with the department and with Ozart. And so I think the idea is to, because it was so successful, to continue that on. And um, yeah. Great. Thank you for <laughs> answering our questions. Yeah. No problem. <laughs> This is now an opportunity for the Pacific Rim Art Society to present. Is there a representative in the audience? Yes. Thank you. Hello, Mayor and Council. My name's Kelly Deacon. I'm the Executive Director for the Pacific Rim Art Society. I've only been in this role for a year. Um, the Art Society struggled for the years during COVID with, uh, we had a changeover of staff and a lack of grants that were written. A lot of our grants that we apply to within the province require us to have municipal support. And we didn't have any through 2022. I think 2021, maybe there was one. Um, Anyways, we're asking for support for the Summer Festival for this year. We're working really hard to re-engage the community. Um, the Summer Festival engages the local community as well as the visitors. Um, this particular grant that we're asking for is for a new component of the Summer Festival, which is a youth event. So we have a youth committee who is just starting. They have their first meeting next week and they are going to um, brainstorm up an event for the summer festival. Then they are going to coordinate it. They are going to execute it and they're going to see it through to the end. And hopefully if that goes over well, then it'll be something that the youth can, can continue on for the next years to follow. Um, that's about it. Thanks, Kelly. Any questions from Council? Councillor Hoare. Trying to be the squeaky wheel. Um, thanks for all you do, Kelly, by the way. Um, and the uh, Battle of the Bands I heard was amazing. I'm sorry I missed it. Um, finale's you, on Saturday. Yeah, finale's this week, so <laughs> you should all be going out on Saturday night. Um, I'm just curious, I noticed in the, um, in your fiscal report here there's the ask from Euclid but there isn't an ask from Tofino are you also requesting um, a grant from them or not we requested uh, funds from Tofino for Missoula Children's Theater okay because our funding for Missoula got cut completely and Missoula was supposed to be in Tofino this year right but because of circumstances wasn't able to happen so we had to just quickly redo so they did support us for the theater. Okay, it just it wasn't on the on the sheet, but that's cool. And Missoula was great, by the way. I, you know, kudos to the kids. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yes, I heard it was kind of a quick change up. They uh, switched plays and switched towns, and and still managed to pull it all off. So that's amazing. That's awesome. <laughs> no, more, no other questions. Okay, thanks very much, Kelly. Uh, the next organization is the Pacific Rim Whale Festival Society. I believe uh, Sarah is on Zoom. I'm just promoting Sarah right now to a panelist. All right, I'm here. I'm just going to show my screen so let me know if you can hear me as well. We can hear you, thanks. Okay, hopefully this is going to work. There we go. Can everyone see that? Yes, we can. Perfect, thank you. Well, good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Um, I'm grateful to be speaking from the traditional and unceded territory of the Tolokuit First Nations. 
My name is Sarah Watt and I'm the Pacific Rim Well Festival Coordinator. So I'm going to give a brief update on the festival in support of our grant in aid, which is a request for in-kind rim donations and $1,000 towards our larger events in Euclula. So I hope everyone's aware the festival is from March the 17th to the 25th. This year is our 35th festival. Um, this year's anniversary reflects the co um, colors coral and jade, which is very fitting for our marine themed nature, and we have lots to celebrate. Um, first of all, I want to um, talk in anniversaries. We want to give um, big congratulations and thanks to Marilyn, who has served as a Wellfest treasurer for 25 years, so it is her uh, silver anniversary. We are very grateful for the knowledge Marilyn has passed on throughout the years, which is especially important for our board of directors, who for some are experiencing their first in-person WOW festival this year. Um, as you can see, we have lots of fresh faces who are dedicated to bringing back the festival to its full potential and exploring new ideas with our communities. Uh, we are very grateful to receive ongoing training by Mo Douglas to dive deeper into the structure and culture of the board um, as the festival develops. So there's always space for a smiley face to join our board, especially as we'll um, eventually be needing to fill Marilyn's shoes as treasurer. So a shameless plug, reach out if you want to um, know more and be involved on the Well Festival board. So 35 years, what's new? Um, we've been channeling our funds back into the festival. Um, we excite, we're excited that we launched our new website. Our calendar of events will be uploaded very soon. The website is more user friendly, which gives people access to the festival on the go from their mobile devices. So that eliminate um, printing as many calendars as we've done in the past. We also want to highlight the work of our sponsors and partners um, and drive donations through website traffic. So our events, um, we're going back to a full in-person festival this year, which is the first one in quite a few years. Um, for our Maritime Kids Day, we have um, one in Tofino on March 21st and in Euclulet for Thursday, March 23rd. So I did put on the application Wednesday the 23rd, but apologies, my mistake, it's Thursday the 23rd. And we've requested for in-kind room space for this event. By supporting this event through in-kind room space, it allows us to cover the cost of entertainment fees um, of our science educators. We have guests joining us from Vancouver Island and the mainland to give a variety of entertainment to our local community as well as our visitors. Um, we continue to inspire, educate and entertain through our events um, and they're, they're going to be held rain or shine. Um, we have events indoors and outdoors. Last year we were lucky to have nearly 1,000 people join us despite the heavy uh, rain that we had all week. So these um, events are going to be made accessible and affordable for people. Um, with help from the grants that we apply for, we can offer most of these events for $5. Um, we're going to be exploring our connection to our West Coast marine environment through food, arts, culture, music, and more. And we are grateful to be partnering with many societies in the area for these events. And yes, Knuckles is back, uh, back by popular demand. Our traditional long-standing events are in the planning. We're very um, happy to say that we've been approved to bring back the Parade of Wells and Wonder. And we are going to be holding a Bailing Bash, which is a festival fundraiser launch in Tofino. So for the $1,000 we've requested to support our events in Euclulet, um, this will be for the Chowder Chowdown and our closing gala. Um, we requested the money um, to showcase our amazing communities and we're very um, grateful to be partnering hopefully with the Pacific Rim Rotary Club. I've just been talking to Cameron Dennison from Tough City Radio and um, yeah, we're excited to bring back the Chowder Chowder Down in a sustainable way which will highlight the delight of our culinary skills we have in our West Coast. And we also want to close the festival in Euclid and bring visitors to our local entertainment spaces um, with our live music acts and businesses that we partner with. So if anyone has any questions, uh, yeah, please let me know. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, just for clarification, I haven't been the treasurer for 25 years. I have been on the board for 25 years, though. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> uh, any questions from council? Councillor Hoare? Of course. Um, <laughs> 
Just a quick question, Sarah. I don't see on the list. I know in the past you've had you've brought in scientists and and had people speaking about you know the offshore killer whales or various other ocean related things. And I'm just wondering if uh, you're going to do any of that this time. Oh yes, there will be. We're going to be partnering with Parks Canada. Um, not everyone's on the list. We actually got a lot of people we're partnering with, um, but Parks Canada are going to be. Um, um, teaming up with the Wild Pacific Trail Society and offering lots of outreach events um, throughout the festival during the week. Um, and also um, we're going to be partnering with um, Strawberry Isle Marine Research Society and they'll be bringing their build a well to the, um, the Maritime Kids Days. I was thinking more in terms of an actual panel discussion, which I know has oh. been done for the last little while. Oh yeah, the panel. So we we are going to have we're partnering with um, Wells of Clackwatt and Barkley um, to team up for their West Coast Guides Forum. So this is going to be um, like a forum and a well seminar. So we're going to be inviting guest speakers, like researchers, biologists, to give fifteen minute presentations um, based on the research in the local area. So we're still in the process of confirming those speakers, but that will be on the uh, Wednesday, the twenty second. For the evening. Cool, thanks. Uh, I'm just wondering uh, more of a question to uh, to staff. Uh, the in kind amount of six twenty five is that going to be sufficient to um, to book rooms for for events during the festival, Miss Monteith? I j I'm not sure where that number how that number was. Through the mayor, Abby's shaking her head no at me. So um, it can be uh, difficult to estimate the in-kind actual the ask. Sorry. So. Eavesdropping. <laughs> Siri? I, I think my phone has uh -oh. the answer you're looking the for. The phone? <laughs> 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 Councillor <laughs> Mafti's <laughs> phone has the answer to the question. Um, what I'll do is I'll go back and I'll just uh, reconfirm that amount with um misfortune and I will I will update the uh, spreadsheet when we go to the regular council meeting great thanks because it's um I think it's for reg for meeting space throughout the year and then the if we hold the chowder chow down the, in the main hall if and the kids day is in the main hall so I'm just thinking that figure just looked a little bit low but thank you for that you're welcome any other questions for Sarah your contact information is on the website, right, Sarah, if anybody wants to uh, volunteer yeah. or join the board? Yeah, for sure. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Thank Sarah. You. The uh, final presentation is for the Rain Coast Education Society. Another Sarah. Another Sarah. Welcome, Sarah. I'm just going to recuse myself at this point. I have a conflict of interest with the presenter. Okay, thanks, Mark. <laughs> I'm here and he's not here. But thank you, Mayor, Council, and fellow not for profits. Um, my name is Sarah Timberlake, and I am the Communication Director for the Rain Coast Education Society. The Rain Coast Education Society is requesting 10,000 grant and aid. Yes, it's a lot, but it's also a lot of programming. So Euclid consistently ranks outdoor activities, youth engagement, community resilience as top priorities, both as a community and within the district and municipal government. Simply put, high quality programming uh, <coughs> pardon me, for youth is needed, wanted, and appreciated above nearly all else. So the Rain Coast Education Field School offers literally hundreds of hours of highest quality education outdoor activity programming to literally every single child in our communities. There is absolutely no other program with the reach and the impact of the Res Field School. Uh, last year, we did make a decision to hire um, teachers, qualified teachers. So uh, with that comes hopefully more money for them. So um, parents, teachers, and school administrators, kids, all of them constantly highlight field school as one of the highest value components of the curriculum of UES. Anybody who has kids knows this is true, and it has been regarded as such since the program began. 
The program runs on business donations and is virtually impossible to secure grants for wages, as most of you know. And now that we've made the commitment to the teacher idea, the wages have to go up. We can't compete with public school wages, but we are trying to offset that with uh, where we live, you know, some perks. Uh, the money would, sorry, the money would offset the 10,000 we're asking, it would offset the 13% of the cost of the program in Euclid. The Euclid program is currently funded and subsidized by the Tofino, Tofino business community, even though we are on our fourth year of offering it in Euclid. We are struggling to ensure the long-term stability of the program without meaningful community support. At this point, we'd like to shout out to the Euclid Co-op. They have committed three years in a row, which makes them our single bis biggest donor in Euclid, and we appreciate that immensely. Field School is a community program for kids in our community, and we are confident there's no other program that can match our impact, and we need the community to support it in a way that keeps it free, accessible, and sustainable. Mark did ask me, and we both forgot to mention, that we are getting now demands from the high school for programming, which is exciting. And we go to a house it, which we just began last year, and Heart, both Heartwood community, or both Heartwoods in each community outreach. Uh, we usually do three or four uh, field schools a year with them, depending on the COVID changed a few factors for all of us, but they're back. That's it. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Um, we've had this discussion, I think, previous years. Should uh, School District 70 not be um, providing some funding for this programming? Um, this is where I'm going to fail you because Mark is the keeper of the knowledge and our bookkeeper didn't come. But I believe that PAC contributes, but I will need Mark to confirm that number. Okay. But and I don't think the school district because your ask is 50% of our budget, right? Okay, questions from council? Councillor Hoare? Mine was a riff on, on yours, is that I believe that, I mean, the SD70 does have money for outdoor programs. I, their, I know so. that Tofino gives us money. I, I just, I don't, wanna, I don't wanna answer incorrectly, but to my knowledge, you clue it does not. Okay, no other questions. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Thank you. You can, you can send uh, Councillor Mafti back in. I'll look to uh, Mr. Lawrence. Is uh, is Councillor Mafti allowed to answer a question about this granting aid? Um, it, with the direct conflict, he, he probably shouldn't. Okay. Thank you for that. So the only one that we didn't hear from was the Rangers. Yes, and I just received an email from Bernadette, and she um, sends her regrets, um, saying that she had to be out of town. Okay, so no one will be presenting for them then? Yes, okay. that's correct. Great. Um, any other comments from councillors? No? All right, we'll adjourn this meeting at 517, and I just want to thank everybody for coming. <laughs> I'll take that as a compliment. <laughs>
early December, staff applied for a destination development fund through the province for two accessible washrooms projects to be located at Brown Be Browns Beach and Hitinkas parking lot. In early January, we were informed that we had been accepted to apply for Stage 2. Last Tuesday, we received the full application form, which is due February 9th. Approval is required for the project from Council for the Stage 2 application. The new facilities will improve visitor and public safety through the provision of hand washing stations, providing accessible washrooms that are currently unavailable, and reduce annual operating costs with our porta potties. Currently, the portable to, to, ah, sorry. Currently, the portable toilets are pumped out every three days due to high, very high use level, if not more and are difficult to maintain in a clean and sanitized manner in the summer months. The cost would be $340,000 for the two, which would be covered through the fund. Any questions? <coughs> questions for Ms. Fortune? Councillor Mafti? Uh, through the Mayor, I'm just wondering if you can give us a very brief description of what these bathrooms would look like and if there's anything comparable that I could use to create a picture in my mind's eye. Absolutely. Uh, let's go to the Cedar Road parking hub and oh, okay. have a look at the washroom. Yeah. Straight copy we're, of we're looking at the straight copy. It meets our needs and the work is already done. Okay. I think it was a really quick turnaround time on this um, grant application. Yes. So uh, just <laughs> copy, copying what we already have was the, the best way to go move forward. So, so that's exciting news. And through the mayor, uh, that's one of the things we're looking at in the next couple of years is our portable, our porta potties, as well as our deep wells, and how we can best meet our needs. And this, I think, this is a starting into this process. I think so too. Uh, the um, the whale parking lot, I think the that one gets yes. extremely heavy use in the summertime. And we are looking. We do have, uh, if you'll remember. Mayor McEwen through the RDS, we do have some funds that we are looking at for the deep wells as well. Uh, so we would probably look at that one as a deep well as we don't have sewer on that. We do have water, but not sewer. At the whale lot? Yeah. Oh, interesting, okay. Any other council questions? Yeah. Councillor Anderson? Through the mayor. Um, is it, how long does it take to build these? And I should know this from the Cedar uh, but I, d I don't so well the nice thing was through the mayor is that we do have the plans in place so it's just a matter of we would order the two and I'm looking to my colleague mr. McIntosh and he's gonna tell me four months oh. yeah so it's nice so a lot of the preliminary work is already done and I'm working with the planning department and the operations department in terms of uh, actually setting how we could put put stuff into play moving forward excellent thank you you're welcome that's that's great quick turnaround yeah. and do we have someone that can build them that you know of yes I'm getting a nod so I'm gonna take that as yes yeah we'll excellent because that can that can be a big delay it can mr. Lawrence sorry um, uh, madam mayor uh, just a point of clarity on that one because of the value of the projects we still would have to go out to RFP um, because of the value of the project so we do have a company that has designed it we've got all the building specifications so it's fairly easy turnaround we know exactly what we want um, it is very likely that that company would bid and be successful um, but it, we, it would be an open process uh, that we'd have to follow to uh, to undertake the project thank you for the clarification no other questions I believe there is a recommendation I've got it I will move that council approve an application for the accessible washroom development project through the BC destination development fund in the in an amount of three hundred and forty thousand dollars do I have a seconder? I will second that. Councillor Anderson, further discussion? Councillor Mafti? Yeah, uh, through the mayor. I understand the need. I appreciate the, like, I, I, I get all of it. One of the immediate concerns that jumps to my mind is based on my experience with a lot of the public bathrooms here and in Tofino. And I'm a little bit concerned about what kind of maintenance is going to be required to keep them in a state that reflects well on the community. I, I know that I've used public bathrooms 
where you walk in and it's it's obvious that the the level of use doesn't line up with the level of maintenance mm. um i again I, i'm not opposed to this project at all i'm i'm just wondering what the long-term implications are as far as ensuring that they're cleaned uh on a frequent enough basis that you know they actually end up reflecting well on the community rather than not absolutely and through the mayor we do have a very rigorous with our public washrooms with the janitorial staff and i think they're able to maintain very well it is a high priority especially in the summer season and i totally understand your concerns i i feel that we're able to maintain in in better situations than we are the the porta potties so i think it's definitely an upgrade but your concerns are duly noted and if i can just ask a quick follow-up question are these going to be open 24 hours a day or are they going to be locked at night What's they would they would have a, they would most likely have a timer on them currently with the uh, washrooms at the aquarium our time is 8 a.m to 8 p.m and then they then they get locked down and it certainly helps with the nighttime issue and then we would just determine the best timing on the ones that we're looking at putting in thank you thank you just to follow up on that the cedar parking hub washrooms are they on timers as well they will be yes they will be okay yeah great any further discussion all in favor none opposed that carries thank you very much thank you our second report item is 2023 to 2027 five-year financial plan this report will be provided by the director of finance with the support of other district staff Ms. Monteith, the floor is yours. Thank you, through the mayor. Um, thanks for uh, letting us double uh, double up the meetings here this evening. Um, just a quick note about this slide. It seems to be a tradition now, but um, this photo was actually taken by uh, Dwayne Lawrence, our CAO. Last year's budget was taken by the previous CAO, so I, I think it's becoming a thing, but uh, it's not very often you see snow on the lighthouse, so we really like this slide. Am I uh, down? I don't know if I can do this many things at a time. Down? Excuse me. Let's try it again. Try now. <laughs> I'm slide uh okay I'll, I'll have issues Excuse me. oh Okay, here we go. So I just wanted to um, show you where we're at in the budget process. So we're at the red circle. Uh, we're having our second budget meeting. Um, in February, I'll be bringing the full uh, draft of the five-year financial plan to council. Um, and then right after that, on February 27th, we'll begin the official public feedback period. And uh, again, a public Feedback goes to community input uh, at if, if you want it to be included in the feedback package back to council. And then we have another meeting booked for April 13th to receive the feedback and direct staff to go ahead and prepare the, uh, the bylaws for approval on um, beginning on May the 9th. Next slide. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Okay, and these next two slides, I'm just bringing them back each time so uh, we keep it in mind. I just want to make sure we remember what our challenges are and what our focus is. Um, these aren't in any particular order, but primarily today we're focusing on capital projects as well as touching a, a little bit on asset management and reducing the reliance on reserve funds to uh, balance our core budget. Next slide. 
And our ongoing uh, budget challenges remain the same. Uh, we know that the Canadian CPI rate for 2022 was 6.8%. I don't have the infographic yet for what it was in BC. Quite often, BC is higher than the rate in Canada, so I need to um, I need to have that uh, that information before I can uh, bring it forward to council. Um, the supply chain is getting better, though, and we're also seeing, of course, better interest rates on our investments um, in it within our own portfolio. So there there starts to be some good news um, along the way. I'm also seeing less vacant lots and more residential homes listed on our, our uh, BC assessment completed roll. So there's more to come on that in February. So what have we been doing since December 8th? That was our, our last budget meeting a couple years ago. Um, we've been uh, packaging up all the operational and capital budgets for 2023. And at that time, when I got it all together, I was $835,000 over, which would mean a massive tax increase. So about three weeks ago, I asked all the department heads to uh, refine their budgets or defer non-critical tax-funded projects to a, f a future year. Uh, they were able to account for about three to $400,000 of it in a variety of ways, which I'll show you uh, in a couple of slides. Um, and then part of my job is to source out and suggest other ways uh, to pay for items. So I have some recommendations of what I'd like to do on the next slide. So the first one is an easy one. I would like to, uh, rather than use tax dollars, I would like to have the Parks and Rec Master Plan come out of the Recreation Infrastructure and Facilities Reserve Fund. Um, at the end of 2022, there will be over a million dollars in it because of uh, last year's council asked to have a, a transfer from Barclay Community Forest into the Recreation Fund um, to put towards uh, a future recreation facility um, or to use it as um, a, gr a matching grant opportunity or, or as leverage to apply for a grant. So 40000 for the Rec Master Plan seemed appropriate in this case. Uh, the second one is, you know, anything to do with affordable housing, I feel should come out of our affordable housing reserve. We have regular contributions to it every year through the MRDT OAP program. So we do have um, a $7,000 item for the housing study update. And then uh, last meeting you heard about the last regular meeting, rather, you heard about the CMRC. Is that right? CMHC. I'm sorry, CMHC, Rapid Housing um, Grant that we're applying for. So that totals 225000 So we're recommending we take it out of the Affordable Housing Reserve. Peninsula Road Stormwater is actually being presented later on by Mr. McIntosh. But uh, I do plan to fund that out of our general capital reserves rather than ask for taxes. And... The, the last two items, the COVID-19 Safe Restart Grant and the early payout of our equipment loans, I actually have a slide for. So let's move forward to the COVID slide. The, for those are, of you who might be unaware, the, in 2020, when the pandemic hit, we received a COVID-19 Safe Restart Grant from the province of BC, um, $764,000. There's some, some costs that are eligible for, for that use. And so it was addressing revenue shortfalls, uh, reopening facilities, um, anything to do with re emergency planning and response, bylaw enforcement and protective services, infotech and services for vulnerable persons. The idea from the province was for everyone to have those funds spent by the end of 2022. That's not a hard deadline, it's not a rule. Um, they're not gonna audit that, but that was the guideline that they left for us. So we have approximately $120,000 left over that we're gonna have to carry over to 2023. 
Um, this is really due because uh, several of our projects just came in under budget, which is always a good thing. Um, and our revenue rebounded quite a bit quicker in <coughs> our recreation programs than expected. So I, instead of using 90,000 to recover revenues, we only needed 20,000 in 2022. We also had an issue keeping the temporary bylaw officer position filled. Um, we had two people in those positions. The, the first person left and then we hired another person and he stayed for six weeks and then he left. So overall we found um, keeping the temporary position difficult to fill. What we did do was then extend out the janitorial services, the two days a week we extended it to the end of December so we have a little bit of money to to carry over is my point and um, I've got some proposed uses of the of those funds on the slide so website rebuild speaks to accessibility and infotech of course so so um, uh, people can can look on our website uh, from the safety of their home um, you heard about the website rebuild uh, during our operational um, budgets from Mr. Rotenberg. So that one's an easy one. Um, anyone, anything to do with the audio, visual, um, infotech, PPE, we're still buying supplies. We're still making sure that our work safe is safe. Blah, safe workspaces are still there. We're still buying hand sanitizer. So it will be easy to use up the rest of the money in 2022 and thus allevi alleviate the tax burden on that for one more year. Any questions about that before I move to the debt slide? Oh. I'm curious about the uh, um, upgrade to the main hall, mm -hmm. the AV. Is that for meetings or is that going to improve the sound for performance and other usage as well? Um, if I could just uh, relay that to Abby, she's got the microphone in her hand. <laughs> Through the mirror, yeah, it's a combination, Councillor Hoare. Uh, we've been doing a lot of work in, uh, in this room, as you're well aware. We're also doing the final strokes in the main hall, but um, mostly we're looking at the sound system. We do have the uh, visual going with the, with the projectors and the screens, and we're just doing the final tweak as it were on the sound system in the main hall sweet i want to hear the kids better <laughs> okay let's have the next slide this is our last recommendation um, from that that first slide um, I'd like to pay out the two equipment loans that we have. I'd like to do an early payout on that. There's no penalties for doing that. Um, we have two fleet loans, which I've highlighted up there. Um, the interest rate is a floating rate. So right now, uh, as of January 24th, the interest rate was 4.77% and it's still climbing. Um, they post a new rate every week. So of course, when we first took out the loans, it was you know it was like 1.94 and 2.68, and it's just getting higher and higher. Um, the pay, if we pay it out early, it'll be about four hundred and twenty-six thousand dollars. If we continue to keep the loans, we're looking at four hundred and seventy-three thousand. So we would be saving about forty-six thousand dollars over the next five years. As well, I don't have to include the $115,000 in the tax requisition either if we just go ahead and pay it out early out of our general reserves. So um, I feel like those are all really good recommendations and it uh, brings me down to almost balancing the core. Now I'm going to talk about the budget adjustments that the managers did. My apologies, I'm going to read off of the notes here. So, <laughs> okay. So, parks operations, um, that budget was mostly due to reducing the seasonal, the second seasonal person from six months down to three, um, and reducing the six weeks casual parks position down to three weeks. 
We also were able to reduce fleet expenses because we've been acquiring new vehicles and our repair bills aren't as high as they used to be. And just making some miscellaneous downward adjustments to line items um, based on the last five years of, of actual. So that, well, that's what all the managers did. They looked at their last five years for every single line item and they adjusted down. It doesn't leave a buffer um, in case things go sideways, but that's, that's the commonality throughout today. The second line, the Parks Capital, um, $15,000 was an ask for a top dresser, and uh, we've decided to move that out to a future year, as well as $30,000 uh, earmarked for the Wild Pacific Trail. The Wild Pacific Trail, um, it, that whole um, project is being retooled and, and kind of packaged into a bundle. We want to know what are we going to do there and, and can we package it up and potentially have it be um, funded through RMI in a, in a future year um, because it is such a, a, it feels like a very RMI touristy um, thing to do rather than have it funded through taxes. It's everybody that comes here uses the trail. So rather than try and do a bunch of little things every year, let's, let's package it up and do something bigger. The fire department capital, we have uh, taken out the tsunami siren and that project can be reevaluated and um, we can source out some grants for that in a future <coughs> year. In the planning and bylaw department, we increased um, building permit revenue by 5,000 and we've made the decision to think about deferring hiring the second bylaw officer. Now this is in favor of keeping our building inspector from Tofino once per week. The building inspector in Tofino is a level two, uh, whereas our, our building inspector here is a level one. So it's really good to have that relationship here. We have so many in the hopper on the go and Nick can come here once a week and they can do the harder inspections when he's here. And at the same time, it mentors our new, our new staff person as she um, works her way up to the level two. Um, and it's just really good to have a, that district to district relationship. Um, but it, what the cost of that is it means that we're gonna have to have a bylaw officer perhaps next year instead. Um, public works and operations, um, Mr. McIntosh uh, again went through his last five years and reduced miscellaneous I line items that have had a little bit of room. Um, nothing huge in particular, it was a bunch of little things, um, but again no buffer if things kind of go sideways. Um, general government, we've increased revenue and interest and penalties to be in line with the actuals, so we're getting a uh, much better rates, of course, on our investments. So we increased our uh, revenue there. And the decrease is uh, basically two things that we're looking at. So the $45,000 that uh, Mr. Rotenberg was speaking about in regards to hiring a records management consultant, um, we've taken that out for now. Um, we still wanna move forward next year with um, an administrative clerk in 2024 that would work in corporate services. And then it, it doesn't appear that we're using the $25,000 um, for the economic development. So we've, we've taken that out uh, for discussion as well. All of these items um, on the last two slides almost balances the core and very, very close. So I'm gonna stop there and see if anyone has any questions about anything that I've just said. Hands up, anybody? <laughs> Councillor Hoare? <coughs> this question might be for Ms. Fortune. Um, if parks, um, that decrease from a six-month temp position to a three-month temp position, how easy is it going to be to hire for just a three-month temp position? I mean, it's already an issue to hire for a six-month temp position, and I'm like... <laughs> I know, horrible question. Three of the mayor. Uh, it's it's what we have to do to re reduce the budget. I what I would target 
is probably university students. So you're looking at June, July, August. And I think that it's, it's well paid for that section. So I think that's what we would do is we would target university students. And we're actually, in fact, going to be doing that this month. We're uh, being February. Uh, we'll be hitting the universities for summer programming. Or sorry, summer jobs. <coughs> Go ahead. Follow up about employment. Um, <laughs> if we're deferring the bylaw temporary position, which I also, s obviously it's been a hiring issue. Um, so now that means we're only going to have one bylaw officer through the summer and that's going to be Brittany. So it's not going to be seven days a week. And, and I just... Through the mayor, that that's correct. Uh, just one clarification: the the bylaw officer that we're looking at hiring in 2024 now is a permanent full time. It's not a temporary position because we're having just way too many issues trying to keep that position filled. But yes, it would mean we only would have one bylaw officer for this year who would work um, five days a week. Um, so it's it's um, looking at what what service level do we want to have in that area i'm able to free up um i have a we have an administrative clerk um who we found a really good connection between uh business licenses and how she can assist some of the administrative tasks in the bylaw office which will free up a little bit of time for um uh, Brittany to be able to be out in the field um we're just kind of trying to limp ourselves along in hard times. So we, we really want to have the, the <coughs> coverage with the building inspection to make sure that those um, permits get issued and uh, that things move along and, and, and that kind of thing. But again, council's decision, so it's certainly open for discussion. Other questions? Councilor the Mayor. Um, I'm curious about uh, paying off the fleet loans. It's 4.77% interest. What are, what are we getting uh, as far as returns on our investments at this point? Oh, that's a good question. I, sh I plan to bring a slide in February on that. Um, so under the charter, we're allowed to invest uh, funds in guaranteed. Um, it has to be guaranteed. We can't lose our principal. So I have a very long list of um, uh, bonds and GICs. Most of them are expiring in May. Mm -hmm. So most of them are on a short-term basis because I didn't know what, what uh, council wanted to do with some of the reserve funds, so I locked them in for that long. Um, they, they range from four and a quarter and up okay. on an annual basis. So, so my question is this, why would we pay off uh, this with today's dollars which are going to be worth less tomorrow when we could invest that money and see a return that almost matches this and sort of keep us flush with cash? Well, I, th I think for me it comes down to a cash flow issue. So we include the debt payment as part of the core budget. Um, so if I'm short the debt payment for the year, it's a tax increase to cover it. Um, the interest on reserves has to stay in the reserve funds. We can't, we can't transfer it over to use for um, general operations. So it, it stays in each individual reserve. Mm -hmm. Does that help? A, a little bit. I'm, I just, uh, when, when you start running the numbers, I don't know that it makes sense to, to pay it off in today's dollars when we were running at 6% inflation. So Mm -hmm. That money's worth less tomorrow, so the money we're throwing, not throwing away, but <laughs> that we're using today is worth a lot more than, than the, the interest on the payment and the principal. Um, so, but if it's a cash flow issue, I understand that. I just... Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Councillor Mafti? Yeah, through the mayor, my question was very similar to uh, Councillor Horace, and I appreciate the need for staff believe me um, but I, I, I have heard from a number of district staff from different departments that it's really hard to attract and retain people short-term people I 
I have to ask myself, like, is it is it even worth it if someone says, you know, we can drastically increase the amount of work that we can do in the department if we hire somebody full time? And if that that's even a viable option, then that's a conversation to have. But it, it really strikes me that, you know, allocating resources to bringing people in for really short term postings, it's, it's like the money's going to get spent. We may not really get our money's worth, depending on who we hire. Um, Again, I'm reiterating a point that's already been made, but I just didn't want you to feel like you were the only one with that point to make. Uh, a second question I had about the summer students is our Canada summer job program hires eligible. Is that something that can be explored rather than paying them f full full rate? A absolutely. We have applied for uh, for the recreation department. We've applied for two positions that will not have a tax implication, uh, but hopefully we'll have grant implications. But that's the summer programs and the Yuki days, which will then back cover anything that we're not able to come through for on grants, so that it's not a tax implication. Okay. We're also um, trying, sorry, through the mayor, we're also um, trying to do a parks grant that is fully, fully funded as well for a summer position. So we're looking into that opportunity as well. Thank you. Good question. Any other questions at this time? Uh, Councillor Mafti? I, I just had one more quick one uh, through the mayor. Um, I, I don't know if this is the time or the place to go into great detail, but I'm just a little bit curious about the possibility of um, allocating or diverting RMI funds to the Wild Pacific Trail. I think that's a, a, a critical resource for our community, not just for people who live here, but it's baffling to me that that's not already where RMI funds are going given that that's like the main attraction one of certainly one of the main attractions bringing people out here and engaging people once they are out here it's exactly the type of tourism that we would like to I think I speak for all of us and the community at large that we'd like to s support and see more of and so I'm I'm really hopeful that that is something that we can do in which case it would make a lot of sense to work with the Wild Pacific Trail Society to perhaps as you suggested, wait until you know a significant chunk of change can be diverted in a more sustainable way. And I'm wondering if you can just give us an idea of how likely that is and what the timeline would be for that. <laughs> there's been a, through the mayor, there's been um, uh, some conversation uh, lately in regards to the uh, resort development strategy that was, uh, um, had to be handed in um, last year. It was it was um, rather untimely. Actually, it was it was unfortunate. It was due when it was because it would have been it would have been nicer to do that with this council. So I'm I'm just going to hand it over to to uh, Dwayne to add on to that. I think. Um, I can add one one other piece to that puzzle is. Uh, or two two aspects of it. So the Wild Pacific S Trail Society no longer operates the trail, so that's been transferred over to the district. So it's a, a completely internal um, operation of maintaining the the trail. There's still activities that the Trail Society d uh, participates in, but we're responsible for the the ongoing maintenance, repairs, and whatnot at the trail. Um, the what ha has happened that is new this go around for RMI is that they are now allowing main maintenance and operation expenditures related to infrastructure that has been built for tourism. So pre this existing plan, so 20, late 2023, um, there was no ability for the province to approve funding from RMI to maintain any of the capital at works that were done under RMI. So it wasn't permitted previously. So uh, we're now looking at that and, and we'll be working with the province on, you know, how can we, we transition the existing plan uh, to fund the maintenance and some of the um, woodworks and platforms and bridges that we need to be replaced that are coming up from RMI, which is now allowed. So previously it just wasn't permitted. So we had to do it all through uh, tax requisitions or reserves. Thank you. 
Thank you for that information. Go ahead, Ms. Bunty. Um, yeah, that that's a good point. Thank you for the update. Um, and it does it does feel like um, the Wild well Pacific Trail is definitely our highest uh, tourism for value. So we're really hopeful that we can put something together. Um, I'm ready to move to the next slide if there's no questions. I just have one more before I call up the, the senior managers to uh, deliver their capital. So just bringing this older slide forward again, um, and uh, generally speaking, in previous years, we've been um, hoping that we underspend during the year, planning for the worst, hoping for the best. Um, and then if we have uh, funds left over, we use that to support next year's financial plan. So um, step one for me, balancing the core budgets is uh, something that's very important and it's uh, something that we're really committing, committed to. Um, if we keep using our reserves to balance our core budget, we're gonna deplete our reserves over time. We do have many challenges along the way, but, um, and there's, there's always non-monetary costs as well. We've just been talking about staffing and, and the, the cost of um, not being able to do everything is uh, capacity. Um, staffing to deliver uh, services is a pretty good example in this case. So it's, you know, it's almost a game of would you rather, would you rather do this or that and uh, see how it goes. So we also don't, uh, still don't incorporate regular dedicated contributions into our reserve funds uh, to fund future capital. It's a little bit hit and miss. So we do have regular contributions into our affordable housing reserve through the OAP. Uh, our small craft harbor is self-funded. So there's an automatic uh, contribution every year into the small craft harbor reserve. And we have $20,000 going into the fire uh, reserve, which is primarily funded by the EMBC road rescue reimbursements. Other than that, I don't have any other reserve, planned reserve contributions for this year. However, we are starting to transition over to this model and we're gonna talk um, a little bit later on near the end when we're talking about reserves and what the balances are and what we're doing about that. We'll talk about that at the end. But I just, I just bring that forward to uh, keep highlighting it. We're almost there. Um, next slide, please, Mr. Lawrence. Good. Okay, so I know the fire chief um, has fire practice and he's the only evaluator we have. So we're gonna let uh, Chief Geddes go first. Thanks, Ms. Monteith, through the mayor. Uh, so just an overview of the uh, fire department upcoming projects. Um, a new emergency response vehicle, uh, we budgeted $70,000. Um, I've got a good line on a vehicle that will hopefully bring us in under the budget. That 70,000 represents the worst case scenario, but I've got a line on a uh, similar vehicle to the one I'm, I'm utilizing now, a used one. Um, positive pressure ventilation fan value of $9,000 and that's a key um, piece of equipment for firefighter safety it allows us to pressurize and uh, and um, decrease the, the temperatures and make it more tenable for firefighters to go into a house it's uh, here against one of those tools that we don't don't use often but when we need it we need it so our, our current fan is uh, is an old gas powered um, unit that's uh, over 25 years of age so uh, it's, uh, we need something more reliable. This would be a battery operated one, which is compatible with all of our battery operated tools that we have as well. So, uh, And then ongoing uh, renovations to the fire halls, upgrades. Um, we only have uh, one officer currently and with the new position, uh, um, we would need to add on uh, some form of uh, office space. And one thing of note from our capital, we moved our turnout gear purchase, which used to be in the, uh, in the uh, capital budget. We moved that to operations. So. Uh, um, there's a slight change there. And then down the road, um, again, our uh, self-contained breathing apparatus is uh, is still functioning, but it's it represents very old technology. It's 30 years old. Uh, parts are becoming tougher to uh, to find and uh, maintenance costs and upkeep is, is increasing. So it's time that that uh, is replaced. So we're looking at that for, for 2024. 
Um, the roof of the fire hall is uh, is hanging by a thread. I've done a little bit of patchwork here and there, but uh, um, I had it assessed a few years ago when I first came to town, and it, uh, at that time they said it was uh, could be on its way out and is on its way out. Could last a year. Could uh, could last a few years. We can piece it together as well. So we've sort of budgeted to to replace. Eventually, we're going to need to. Um, also due for replacement is our engine two, which is a 2001 engine, which is uh, actually exceeded its uh, its useful life at this point. But we're going to try and stretch it to 2026. Um, and again, 800,000 represents worst case. I'm looking at options uh, there as well. Uh, tsunami warning system uh, sirens. Uh, that's uh, adding to our current uh, system that we have in place. Um, the goal is that eventually you'd be able to hear the sirens for uh, almost anywhere you are in town, which isn't the case now. We have a good basis of a system, but um, that's just an expansion of what we have. Here again, often there are grants available for that, so I'm, I'm always looking for, uh, for opportunities to uh, have that partially funded. Uh, typically those grants are uh, for a maximum of $25,000. So. And then, of course, fire hall replacement, which is uh, um, which should be on the radar now. And, and uh, um, we've got a, a uh, grant application uh, in that I'm, I'm waiting uh, results for. And uh, there's a picture of our new fire hall. Now, it's actually a, a recent uh, fire hall that was built for Bowen Island, which represents a sort of a similar size uh, structure that we would uh, possibly be looking at. So we've applied for $6 million. Uh, a grant that would cover up to six million dollars and with the district uh, um, adding in a maximum of 1.5 million dollars on top of that so uh, and I'm still waiting to hear uh, the status of that grant I've uh, I phoned UBCM uh, a while back and they told me to call back mid-February so I've literally got it written on my calendar in mid-February that I will phone them and, and see if there's any updates so at this time there's no update on that that's all I have unless there's any questions any questions from councillors? Nope. Looks like you did, gave a thorough report. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, good luck with that grant. Thank you. Welcome, Miss Fortune. Is your microphone on? No. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <coughs> Let me try again. Good afternoon. <laughs> uh, so the before you, you have the Village Green Playground project. This is a project that will be RMI funded, and we will be. S we've already started the project. We had a public engagement session in August of 2022. And then we're just working through it as Village Green sorted itself out with moving forward on its project, which is starting tomorrow, I believe, which is very exciting. Um, and I, in the same tone, will be meeting with Peter from Lanark, who was a big part of the project for Village Green. And we will be putting together our next steps of design and RFP for purchase equipment, install, and then, of course, we get to play. Any questions on that one? Don't see any. Do we get advanced access to the playground? We'll talk. <laughs> so the other really exciting, I've got a number of projects going on in the next couple of years, but this is one of the other really big ones that we're working on right now. And it's gonna take some time to sort through this. So we're early stages, I will, I will say that. Um, so we did receive RMI funding of 435, I said that right, yes, thousand for that. And then we're looking at potentially um, 300,000 from Small Craft Harbor Reserve or other grants such as ICT, for example. Our next steps is looking at planning environmental and indigenous consulting. We obviously have to connect with Sm Small Craft Harbor DFO and the province big part of what's going to be happening in 2023 is planning and working with DFO and the province in terms of ensuring that we get everything that we need as well as buy-in from the community as well. Um, so the pathway sections, there's a couple of different, I call them A, B, C, and D, but <laughs> 
So we've got the causeway area, which we uh, dismantled, I think, about four or five years ago. It was basically falling apart. So that's the 120 meters along the causeway. We have the 65 meters of the gazebo section, which is currently closed, which is what you're looking at right now. So that, that would be, the gazebo would be our priority to move forward on this one. And so we are working with uh, DFO in the province right now to get the upland uh, portion of the, the property to move forward with that. And then we're looking at 300 uh, meters of footage of, sorry, footage, frontage in the inner harbor and possibly 100 meters by the campground, by Uculet campground. So there's a number of processes. A lot has to do with getting the right permits in place and then being able to work forward from there. And I will certainly be keeping you guys up to date throughout the year as we plan the project. I think it's going can potentially be an extremely exciting project for the community. Any questions, I will do my best to answer. Just really happy to see this one moving forward. Yeah, it's been too. on on the books for a number of years. It has. Don't see any questions. Thank you very much. Welcome, Mr. Greg. Thank you. Uh, I'm just speaking to one slide on the affordable housing uh, reserve and the projects that are associated with it. And I'll, I'll start at the, actually at the bottom of the slide um, where it, it mentions the balance. So the estimated balance as of sort of the, the start of the year, the end of the year is $1.1 $1 .1 million in the affordable housing reserve. And uh, currently what's sort of earmarked, um, it, so there's some projects. So the first, the lot 13, um, which is a 33 unit affordable and attainable housing project, which is the lower picture there on the slide. That uh, previously council had, had earmarked three hundred twenty thousand uh, dollars to contribute towards that project, <coughs> and just as a bit of a, a, a recap, so that's thirty three units. Twenty two of them are for sale. Eleven of them would be rental. There's a housing agreement that is on the title of each of those lots. Once those lots are created, um, that would uh, essentially uh, ensure that the the occupants and the um, Rental rates are as spelled out, which would be West Coast residents of certain incomes. The for sale product and the financing of this is through BC Housing, through their affordable home ownership program. So there's, would there be an agreement with the district where any contributions that the district makes are um, towards reducing the cost of this? Eventually, if those houses sell out of the program and one day somebody who's not a qualified buyer pays more for them and then they basically the uh, BC Housing holds a second mortgage, funds come back out and are returned to the district plus any increase. Um, if there was a you know, profit, there's a portion of that comes back to the district to our affordable housing fund to fund future projects. So the money and, and including the money that BC Housing puts into the project all comes back to the district affordable housing fund. So that they're sort of way of describing it is that, okay, if this is a project, it's really geared towards creating new housing supply and getting people into homes and getting them, you know, in started in the housing market uh, so that it, um, it keeps the money in the community. So that's my brief-ish uh, re recap, because I know it's, it's been a, a couple of years since rezoning went forward for um, lot 13. There's quite a bit of interest. So that $320,000 was equivalent to the cost of DCCs. We couldn't just waive the DCCs, but essentially it would be contribution to help with the surfacing of the new road and whatnot, which becomes a municipal road. I think we've all been expecting that or waiting for an additional, perhaps, uh, request, which we received on Friday. <laughs> we're still waiting for a letter from BC Housing, and we're going to try to bring it to council at your next meeting for um, also just a, a, a request for dealing with some additional costs that were not anticipated by the developer to uh, ensure that the new units would be safe from the risk of flooding due to tsunami. Because it is in a low-lying area, we now have a mapping of this, so, so that will be coming forward uh, for consideration in the very near future. Um, any questions on Lot 13? Not seeing any. Uh, so then 1300 Peninsula Road, that five units, I think it was just last week. Um, seems like a while ago because we're busy madly trying to put together a grant application for CMHC. Um, so council saw this and, and earmarked um, a total was $225,000 uh, to support that uh, more sort of like uh, shelter affordable housing project and hopefully will be successful and we're, um, yeah. 
more to follow. There'll be a report to council um, prior to the grant deadline, which is March 15th, uh, where we'll lay out a whole bunch of details on how it's going. But uh, we are hoping to issue an RFP uh, this week on that one. And then the last one, the Housing Authority and or Housing Corp contracts that fifty to $80,000. So previously, council had essentially um, had authorized us to issue an RFP for you know providing the service of that housing authority housing corporation we haven't issued it it was really because the discussion was at the point it's needed and that really could be as you know as is re required either by the volume of private development creating some affordable housing that needs to be managed or um, with council direction if there's you know district projects sort of get us to the point where hey it's critical that we have this um, you know Set added capacity will then we be putting out an RFP to initial in the initial years have it essentially as a contract with a consultant to provide that function. As I mentioned with lot 13, there's 11 rental units. 11 is a small number, but it would mean annually we'd have a little you know report from 11 homeowners or 11 uh, property owners uh, providing the documentation that they're required under their housing agreement showing. Yes, a qualified person is there. They're paying the rent as was stipulated. It's going as planned um, and follow up. So that would be, you know, yes, that is an amount that we're, you know, to, to, the, to the scale of 11 units, we can probably handle it by staff. But at some point, it becomes a job just managing the housing. So that's where that RFP and potential service could go. So at this point, we haven't issued the RFP because we're just don't, the housing units don't exist yet to really trigger that, I guess. That's what all I've got, unless there are questions. Councillor Kennington, through the mayor, the fifty to eighty thousand dollar contract uh, would that come out of the affordable housing fund? Yes, this slide is suggesting these are the things that, okay. that reserve fund is sort of sitting, so sitting for. So that wouldn't be in addition to sort of like taxation, but it's sort of things that have been discussed or earmarked for that reserve specifically. Thank you. I don't see any other questions, so thank you. Welcome, Mr. McIntosh. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. So I have about 12 slides here in front of us, and uh, included in them are both public realm slides uh, projects rather and infrastructure projects as well. So first in front of us is a very timely slide uh, as Ms. Fortune mentioned starting tomorrow Village Green ready for construction. So the scope of that project is to improve the accessibility um, for pedestrians and traffic around the uh, Village Green area. Um, so with a focus on Main Street intersection Fraser and and uh, Cedar Lane as well as expand the Village Square area for locals and visitors to use and enjoy, as well as expand the playground. That project budget is $1,475,000, and it has three funding sources, um, a grant, the Tourism Dependent Community Fund, gas tax, and RMI. To date, we've spent funds on uh, consulting fees for site analysis and design, which is completed now as we pass off to the construction team. So we've consumed about 14% of our uh, project budget. Uh, we've also received an extension on our grant, and so we now have uh, an additional year to build, but the uh, construction team and the construction schedule is set to start tomorrow and be completed by June. So that project is on track and looking good. Amptrite House, so this is a project uh, in a similar, similar phase as Village Green as well. The scope of this project is to was to revision and, and transform uh, what was an underutilized residential facility at the base of Coast Guard Road into a premier public facility uh, for the enjoyment of locals and tourism as well. Uh, so that project budget is one million six hundred and ninety-two thousand dollars, and it also has three funding sources. So a grant, uh, the ICIP Investing in Canadian Infrastructure Program. RMI funds as well, and Tourism Vancouver Island. Uh, currently to date, we've, we've spent uh, funds on consulting again, site analysis, architecture fees, and similar to the last project, we've also consumed about 
16 percent of our of our budget so we're we're in a similar phase there it's now passed off to the construction team and and ready for construction essentially so uh, looking forward to a spring demolition and a, and a spring and summer build in front of you Peninsula Road safety and revitalization I have about three or four slides that relate to uh, specifically Peninsula Road and and the, the three objectives that that asset uh, we're, we're, we're looking and working on to improve. So those of course are the, the boulevard and pedestrian safety works and the beautification uh, along those boulevards um, as well as the storm and infrastructure work underneath those boulevards and Peninsula Road and the paving that's to follow uh, once all that's complete. So this slide in front of you is about the Boulevard Works, Peninsula Road Safety and Revitalization. Again, that scope is to, as you've seen, and you'll see more of, is to uh, improve the boulevards, pedestrian movements, and beautify the, the central corridor of our community. The total project budget is $1,890,000. It has three funding sources as well, gas tax, RMI, and CCRF grant. Currently, we've consumed about 14% of our total project budget, and that's been on site analysis, consulting fees, and design work. Um, so next steps there, looking forward to bringing to uh, Council in February a follow-up report uh, about where we are with the design work and uh, some options for Council to consider and, and move that project forward to complete design and then on to construction. Peninsula Road stormwater. So this is an infrastructure need that's quite critical, and it involves the um, assessment, design, and rehabilitation, reconstruction of the storm infrastructure underneath P Peninsula Road uh, in between Forbes and Maine. And so it facilitates uh, infrastructure improvement that allows further construction to happen on top of it. So this project budget right now, the figures that you have in front of you are very high level figures that we've assembled to help as placeholders and move this conversation forward uh, in, in our budget with, with council and with other funders such as the Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure. So Coors Engineering completed a concept study several years ago and it was determined that to replace that storm work was about $2 million. And we've since broken that down to uh, what we could potentially put into funds in, in 2023, um, as, well as, an as well as a potential for an agreement with the ministry. So none of that has been finalized yet. It's, it's, uh, I, I, we're gonna be moving forward as quickly as we can to try to align that project with the Peninsula Road work as well. So uh, potentially three sources, uh, two, two sources there for that Stormworks. Uh, DOU, uh, district coming out of capital reserves, and, and as well looking for engagements with the ministry. Um, next steps there are um, conversations with the ministry, uh, a, a well-defined analysis of who owns exactly what. We're still working through that dynamic and then into a shared cost agreement, into design, and into construction. So this summary table that you have in front of you uh, just, just summarizes those three key objectives that I've, I've, I've just uh, referenced. The Peninsula Road Revitalization Project, um, which is moving its way through design, hopefully ready for construction in the fall. Peninsula Road Stormworks, um, shared cost agreements to be to be or organized and determined design work hopefully and then construction as well al aligned with that project and then uh, paving shortly after that so this represents just just under about ten million dollars or, or nine million dollars of works that uh, could be earmarked from different sources um, to be focused on Peninsula Road alone so uh, several layers here that, that are, are very important to the district and to Peninsula Road. And uh, this is a big year for Peninsula Road that we're trying to move forward. Maybe just there, uh, please uh, jump in at any time. 
Yeah. Do you have any questions specific to that? Any <coughs> questions? Councillor Hoare? Question about the, not Peninsula Road, um, Village Green actually. I'm just wondering about the, is it staged construction? Like are you doing a section? I'm just wondering about like how long the Main Street intersection corner is going to be out of commission. Is it going to be completely from Feb 1st to June 1st or is it maybe that gets worked on first and then I'm just wondering. Through the mayor, so so great question. So it's um, it's phased in terms of construction activity. So demolition will happen first, re really across the whole project. But in the next week, what I'll be looking forward to is some civil works happening on the corner of of Maine and Cedar and Fraser that area, and then it'll span out, expand out from there. So. Um, the contractor has provided a fairly detailed construction schedule that we have, and uh, I'd be happy to share that as well. Um, and they have a traffic management plan that affects uh, how traffic and pedestrians will move through the course of construction. So there's about four different uh, plans or, or stages to move pedestrians and traffic through those intersections uh, as they pass through different courses of construction. Um, so I'm happy to share that with council as well, if desired. And uh, uh, you've been in communication with UHS, the fish plant, with regard to their, their trucking traffic? Through the mayor, y yes, we've sent out uh, communications and had engagement with all the uh, key stakeholders in that priority area. Great, thank you. Yeah, that was part of my concern was the amount of traffic and the increases that happen with the, as the fishing season progresses into hake season. I mean, same thing applies to construction happening at Amphitrite during the busy season on the trail, right? It's kind of makes me kind of do this. <laughs> I don't see any other questions. So do you, do you have more slides? Yes, we do. Okay. <coughs> Large row, please. Large road, the scope of this project is to improve uh, for pedestrians and vehicles, the safety uh, modality and use of, of Larch Road. Um, this is a project in design, is paired along with the design of Peninsula Road as well. Um, Council will recall that those came out of the same, the, the same project initially, and then because of um, funding sources and increased cost, the construction of Larch Road was removed essentially until funds could be received. So that design is, is, is uh, making its way. It's, uh, it's nearing completion now. And then we have uh, the district staff um, are, are waiting for updates on, on grants, essentially. So um, yeah, so the next step there is, is uh, waiting for confirmation on grant funding and then uh, anticipating forwarding that through an open process and RFP onto construction. The scope of the water supply submarine replacement line is, uh, uh, Council will recall, in January of last year, um, of, of course this line was damaged by um, you know, uh, unforeseen circumstances, um, a, a tsunami and, and a barge, of course. And so that line has been out of service since that time. We've been um, utilizing a second line to provide water to Hitatsu while working through this line. So. Uh, working through the, the potential replacement of this line. Um, so the estimated cost to replace that, that line, that, that uh, uh, submarine water line, is about $1 million, and that includes the ballast, uh, design work, and, and installation as well. Um, this, the district staff, uh, uh, CEO Mr. Lawrence, uh, has, has worked with EMBC to um, secure um, funding in, in a total of $652,000, so that would go towards this project, as well as uh, reserves for $348,000 to this project. So uh, that's a project that I'm looking forward to putting out in an open process, an RFP, and it's, uh, it's on my desk as we speak. So looking forward to getting that out as soon as possible.
This next infrastructure project uh, is titled Victoria Lift Station Bypass. And so the scope of this work is it's essentially maintenance. It's to install uh, a, a couple of lines, uh, th three lines as, as the illustration uh, shows on Victoria Road um, and, and Marine Drive and then a new manhole as well. So what that would do is it would divert black water away from that lift station so that critical maintenance work could be done on that lift station. Uh, this, that, this year we did a fairly comprehensive analysis of all the district lift stations, uh, including looking at their capacity, their flow rates, and then as well as brought in an external contractor from out of town to do a bit of a preventative maintenance check-in. And then from that did a, did a sort of a summary level of what's our worst lift station in, in the district. And so this is first on our first on our list to really tackle and get, get inside and do a full full analysis. So, so th th this allows us to take a look inside. I suspect in the, in the year ahead, you'll, you'll likely council will be hearing me speak more about this list station and, and uh, what's next for it. This table in front of us represents the vehicle fleet review. So in the five-year plan, there's just shy of, of $1 million here to um, replace uh, life cycle vehicles as well as, um, yeah, I don't think we're purchasing any new. So, so this is f just full replacements on end-of-life vehicles. In 2023, we're, we're hoping, we're, we're proposing replacing a one ton for $65,000, uh, a pickup truck that's reached the end of its service life, ah, uh, purchasing a new emergency response vehicle, my apologies, for $70,000 for the fire department and totaling $180 uh, in 2023. 2024, uh, another F-150 truck replacement, 2025, uh, replacement of, of engine two and then carried over into 2026. So quite a significant and important uh, fire life and safety uh, vehicle procurement and replacement for the district. <coughs> this next capital project is the water treatment and filtration. The scope of this project is to improve the quality of district's uh, drinking water um, and bring the drinking water uh, in, in line with the Canadian Clean Water Drinking Guideline by um, installing, de designing and installing a, at this point two new water treatment facilities and as well as increasing the water capacity for the district by designing and installing a new water reservoir. I'll just back up one year just to reference a quick number. So when we originally um, went through the feasibility study and grant application for this project, this project was estimated to be $9.6 million. When we were in preparations to go out for our RFP, we went, went through a cost consultant and did another cost analysis. That project cost jumped to $20 million, $745,000. So, <coughs> so what, what, what we're looking at doing essentially is through um, analysis and value engineering work is taking a really, really concerned hard look at how can we reduce the scope of this project. Um, to deliver really the same key objectives of providing clean drinking water for the district for 30 years, expanding our capacity and, and, and being fiscally responsible and, and really navigating that, that path as carefully as we could. So um, it, at, at that point, I'll probably just pass it off to Ms. Mondeeth, uh to talk about boring. Unless, uh, is there any just questions? Any questions? No, looks good. Uh, oh, wait. Sorry, one super quick one through the mayor. If you, if you <coughs> go back to the vehicle fleet, 
Um, the engine number two, is that the same vehicle that Chief Geddes was telling us about? Okay, I, I'm not like nitpicking. I'm just curious why. Is the 600000 there the anticipated cost of the vehicle? Or how does what's the discrepancy because he had budgeted 800,000 if i'm not mistaken was that is that just sort of his top end and this is thank you yeah through the through the mayor um yeah the the two hundred thousand dollars in 2025 is the deposit that we would have to put down on the truck and then there's usually a one to two year rate right now for a truck to be uh, built if it's new so uh, the two and then the six add up to the eight gotcha thank you very much you're welcome any other questions? Seeing none, you're good to go. Thank you. Okay. This one's kind of, uh, this one's important. So I've got some notes here. So I, I really wanted to demonstrate the impacts of, of borrowing funds and how the escalating interest rates and construction costs affect um, the district and, and thus the the users of the water and the, and the taxpayers. So um, first of all, in regards to the column on the right, uh, you can't read all the words, but it says uh, liability, liability servicing limit. So the province places a liability servicing limit on municipalities in order to mitigate the risk. Um, essentially, no more than 25% of annual revenues is the basic formula. So for us, that works out to $1.5 million per year in debt payments. And that was um, our amount allowable in 2021. The province also posts that information for all communities on their website uh, based on the reports that we have to do in the spring after our audit is complete. So it's, um, it's uh, information that can be easily attained on the, on the website. So previously, I'm talking about the first line now, previously, as Mr. McIntosh had, had mentioned, um, this project was much less e expensive and the debt servicing along with lower interest rates was really quite manageable. Um, we, at the time, had thought that uh, raising the water user fees 4.5% each year until 2025 would help supplement the yearly debt payments. Um, we also thought that uh, the community growth would happen a little bit faster um, and that that hasn't happened yet so the first line uh, represents uh, showing us how the interest rates were 1.98% in 2021 and the yearly payment was a little over $100,000 a year for 30 years so that seemed like not a, not a bad deal at all to uh, get uh, clean drinking water in Eucalypt so now, as Mr. McIntosh was saying, the, the uh, cost of the project has more than doubled, as well as the cost of uh, borrowing those funds. Um, and just a, a point of clarity, the, the, the long-term loans are kind of, you know, they're basically the same as a mortgage. So the, the interest is always calculated on the original amount that you borrowed. It's not a declining balance. So you're always paying that, that amount. Um, we have to use the 10-year indicative rate that's posted on Municipal Finance Authority's website. So today it's 4.28%. 4 so I wanted to give you, you using the 4.28%, I wanted to give you some examples of what the yearly debt payments could look like. So, pardon me, I've given a $5 million, an $8 million, and a $13 million example. Um, along with how much of our liability servicing limit it would use. Um, I also noted at the bottom of the slide, just because I like to look at averages, um, the average debt servicing per town in BC in 2021 is approximately 15%. So we have a, a bylaw authorization of up to $13 million. So if we take that 13 million and look at the yearly payment of $798,000 a year uh, for 30 years, we're looking at right now it would use up about 53% of our limit. Plus we also have two other loans outstanding that we can't pay out early. One is for the, the building that we're sitting in right now, the UCC, and for Fire Engine 1, which uses about 
8% of our, our, our uh, liability limit. So we would be sitting at 61%. Um, that's not a comfortable, <laughs> comfortable number for me at all. It makes me very nervous. Um, it will really tie our hands um, long into the future. Um, this is just one project of, of many that we're going to have to do over the next uh, long while, um, you know, replacing all the infrastructure, replacing buildings, replacing everything in the ground. So this is a, a pretty big, um, it's a pretty big concern for me. So um, we also can't pay it off early. So once, once we go through construction and take out our temporary loans, eventually it has to be locked into that 30 years and we have no way to get out of it. So we have to try and pay as much as we possibly can so that we don't borrow $13 million. Um, what else do I want to say about that? Um, I, I mean, I, I feel like I just want to say that this really highlights the concern. We are, I have another slide coming up of, of things that we're doing about it, but I think at the end of the day, if if we aren't able to get that $13 million down, um, you're probably going to have a report from me saying we might not be able to do the project. So it, it's really important that we do as much as we can to um, to work through this. So if we just go to the next slide. Um, as Mr. McIntosh mentioned, we're taking steps to refine this project. So how can we still meet the objectives of the grant by doing the project differently? Do, do we have, did we over design it? Is there something else that we can do that still meets the objectives of the grant so that we can still keep the $7 million, but not borrow as much? And the objective of the grant is of course, clean drinking water and you kill it. Um, Last year in 2022, we did collect 3% in property taxes, and we've put that aside specifically towards paying um, for the uh, debt payments that are going to happen. Um, we are proposing in our formula another 3% this year. I think the intention of, of council last year was to keep it at 3% every year, but um, we, we've got it in the budget for 2023 to put it specifically in the water reserve. We're also we're going to have to review our water user fees because four and a half percent isn't even at inflation right now. So we're going to have to revisit that, just the water program as a whole, as well as the project itself. Um, we can defer our long-term borrowing as long as we possibly can by using our water capital reserves and temporary loans. So, for example, in 2023. Looking at the new timeline that we have, we may only need about $96,000 next year. Um, we can pay that out of our water reserves, so it, it delays the borrowing. Um, and then we can also look at options to decrease the total borrowing by maximizing our contributions. So um, I don't know. I don't know if there's another grant out there that we could apply for that would be allowable to stack onto the grant that we currently have. A lot of the grants have stipulations that you can't grant stack. Um, we, we do also have the Berkeley Community Forest um, funds available as well. I think that's going to come back to council at some point to discuss. But anytime we can uh, take a look at that principle and make it as low as possible, um, it's going to serve us better in the long run. And I don't know if Dwayne wants to pop in here or if council has any questions. That was a lot, but I'll stop there for a minute. Yeah, I I think the only, uh, uh, thank you, Donna. Um, I, I don't have much to add on to it. Uh, we are looking at every possible avenue to maximize the, the benefit of that grant of $7 million to provide that uh, filtration and uh, water storage capacity project. Um, but it is very concerning to be um, currently proposing, I'm going to go back to slide, or a slide here, to that <laughs> that $798,000 in in annual payments. Um, and I think it's it, it's 53% of our total borrowing capacity. So it, it's critical for for council and the community to understand that what that would mean long term. So 
over the next 30 years, we would be at 53% of our total borrowing capacity. So that if that means if we had a major incident with water lines, sewer lines, um, our water treat or sorry, uh, wastewater treatment facility, um, any new buildings. So if we, you know, the, the replacement of the fire hall, which is on the list, uh, replacement of the rec hall, which is on the list, the ability for the municipality to borrow to make those projects happen is very challenging uh, because we're already at 53% for the next 30 years. So we're trying to uh, maximize the scope of the project to do uh, to achieve the goals but not spend nearly as much. The estimate that um, Mr. McIntosh uh, uh, gathered uh, back when we did the AAP process um, is class D estimate. Um, so there's lots of wiggle room in there, but it could go either way. Um, one of the things that, that we've seen and, and we've all heard about is in Tofino, um, their was wastewater treatment facility went from 35 million to 75 million dollars. Um, the uh, Their new recreation facility went up to 14 million dollars it's escaping me how much it started at <laughs> i think it was six or something um eight nine <laughs> count the fingers um so it, we can see this escalating of cost um in similar types of projects in this in this area um what is happening that is pro is a benefit for us is that we are seeing the demand for works decline a little bit. So we've been through COVID that has escalated the sur um, the supply chains is getting a little bit better. Uh, the availability of contractors is starting to become more positive on the, the buyer side rather than the contractor side. So we might might see some relief on that side, but it's really critical for us to get that number down as much as possible. So right now we are aiming for that $8 million mark. Um, it is very premature uh, to say that we're there. Um, so we've got a lot of work to do. Uh, Mr. McIntosh is working very hard with our consultants and our engineering firm to to figure out what we can do and uh, and do it most effectively, um, but if we if we're stuck at thirteen million dollars, um, as as Miss um, Monteith uh, indicated, we would be coming back to council saying, how important is this project, and are you do you, are you comfortable with the implications of undertaking the works for the next thirty years? Right, because that's how long it would impact this community. So um, we are we are very concerned. <laughs> um, we are doing everything that we can to minimize this, um, and we hope that we're going to be able to bring it down to that eight million dollars, or even less if we if we're really lucky. <laughs> so if, if council has any other questions, we'd be happy to to try to answer them. Question through the mayor: Where are we at with metering? water because right now it seems like it's just a, a flat rate and some of us are using a lot and some of us aren't using any at all. So I'm just curious um, if that would have an effect on the demand which would sort of reduce the stress or what we figure we need. I think Mr. McIntosh has uh, the best answer for you. Uh, through, through the mayor. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's a great question. The um, so we we have um, not not all homes are metered and, and not all businesses are metered. So we have a program that's um, uh, growing and, and, and gathering strength and with, with policies and procedures. And as, as new builds go in, we're requiring meters and we're doing spot checks in the field to install meters. And so, really, I I would imagine we probably have about a a multi-year to a 10-year window to have every, every facility metered in the district. So that, that would be a good goal for us to try to achieve, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and and so it, it, it affects the, the consumption and distribution uh, of the capacity side of our uh, water treatment system. 
and so we can uh, improve the supply side, and that's really what we're focused on with this grant and these works. And then there's all sorts of little sub-programs that we can do, such as um, um, chasing, chasing leaks, um, fixing pipes, bringing infrastructure projects that helps uh, contain inflow and infiltration into our system, et cetera. And that improves the distribution system. So um, we, we want to do both. And I, I look forward to bringing counsel how that sort of left side of that equation is going to advance through asset management practices. Thanks. I don't see any other questions. Oh, Councillor Mefti. Uh, I, have, I have one question. This goes back to the original presentation. My understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong or if I'm misremembering, but the, the, the primary concern about the water has to do with manganese levels and with ensuring that the you know quality meets a certain standard at the, at the cost that we're looking at here and i understand and appreciate efforts to sort of aim for that eight million dollars i don't know how realistic it is that a project's going to come in at half budget there are only a few thousand people in this community is there an option to treat water like at the source with um you know, like some add-on at the tap or something like that at the, at the community level that would actually make it affordable for the end user rather than to treat all of the water? Like, is is there is there... I understand the rationale, but is there a cheaper way to achieve the same goal? The... The, the, the treatability that we're, we're, we're attacking right now... Um, it, it, it addresses filtering the manganese out at the well source. And so a, a lot of our infrastructure, all of it really, our, our water infrastructure has been designed and, and, and built with that system in mind. Um, so uh, that you know, the, the, the past, since the 1950s, this, this infrastructure has been in place. And um, this, this project, and, and this this treatability, this concept, um, is is kind of the most tried, and 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 true and and, and well known method for reducing um, um, s simple metals out of the system. So so manganese. And uh, just just to speak to the reduction of the scope. Uh, so what what we be looking at doing, in in concept, is reducing. Um, large elements out of the project and, and so we'd essentially it I, I, I we're looking at perhaps uh, maybe deleting the Bay Street treatment plant from the scope and and maybe deleting the reservoir from the scope as well um, and then we have we have, we have a strategy uh, uh, sort of a feasibility st study to sort of show uh, how we can produce the same results the same objectives and we might have been over designed in the beginning so can we delete that facility? Can we delete that, that reservoir and just build the lost shoe treatment plant, uh, treat at the source, knock out the manganese, and then provide clean drinking water to the district for just the cost of that one facility? So that one facility is about $8 million, as it turns out. So uh, that, that strategy is um, what, what, we're, what, what we're sort of bringing forward to council. Um, and just look forward to having more of those conversations. But I, I can share that um, through work with our, our engineering firm, we, we've looked at uh, all, all the common methods and, and what, what's being used out there and what's the best way to get us through this problem. Thank you. No further questions? Thank you. Um, I just wanted to touch on uh, uh, re-examining the, the user fees as well on the water when we talk about you know flat rates and um, metered rates. Um, the, the idea of collecting uh, property taxes to service the debt, um, we're not, we're not, we wouldn't be collecting from all of the people that are using our system because of course we provide water to um, Yukilithat and uh, South Long Beach as well. So that's another reason why we really want to have a second look at user fees to make sure that um, we're, we're getting all of the people that are using the system. 
um, the property tax uh, request that we're doing for now is uh, kind of minimal when we look at a project of this magnitude, but that we would like to transition over to the user fees. So what that could look like is, you know, maybe it's um, a flat rate per bill specifically to pay for this project. But again, as, as, as uh, Councillor Mafti pointed out, we don't have uh, we don't have a lot of users you know we're talking about maybe 1200 you know water bills so it, it's a really complicated matter it's a, it's an expensive process and we're looking at every avenue we can i mean we've talked about well what if we flush twice a, twice a year and what if we just buy water filters for everybody like we were just you know we just sit in the room and talk about all kinds of different things so um, we're not really, we're not ready to give the money back yet. We're not ready to pull the trigger and move forward yet, but we want to make sure that we're using, um, our funds as well as the grant funds in a responsible manner. So we, we really just need to continue to, um, do the best we can to make sure that we're doing the right thing. And of course we provide water for all our tourists as well, Yes. but the, um, the hotels are all metered, I assume. That's a good question. I believe they all have bulk meters, but I can certainly um, certainly check, and they get p uh, charged per per unit. Thank you. Should I move on? Please. Okay. Yep. So the next three slides are all of our capital projects in 2023 as a summary. Um, we didn't do slides for every single capital project that we have on the go. We just sort of did the highlighted ones today. So um, uh, if feel free to take a look. So the, the first slide here is um, any capital projects that are new, that are not currently in the adopted five-year financial plan. Um, everything on this slide except for one, the UCC storage, um, is funded by... Uh, things other than taxes. So the, the storage uh, facility for the UCC is a, is a tax requisition. Everything else is funded through reserves or grants or um, MOTI, RMI, and that kind of thing. So um, just going to pause and see if anybody has any questions. Uh, there were quite a few slides from this particular, w actually there are slides for most of them. Um, and the manager spoke about most of them. The next slide is our carry forward projects. So those are projects that are that were adopted in the 2022 to 26 five-year financial plan. Um, many of them have already started, uh, and Village Green, of course, starts tomorrow. Um, Again, I think every single one of these does not have ta tax dollars associated with it. So again, it's uh, some sort of reserves or COVID money or a grant or RMI. I'm pretty sure we have our electric charging station going into the Cedar Road parking lot um, as we speak as well. And then the last slide, there's a couple more carry forward projects. Um, we just talked at length about the very first one there, the water filtration and treatment plant. Tugwell Fields, the rec uh, facility, um, just in concept phase right now. So we have $25,000 coming out of the rec reserve for that. Um, with a, a placeholder for $5 million for a, some sort of rec facility, um, that needs to be discussed um, as a concept with a report to council. Um, we've talked about uh, vehicles. Um, Harbor Capital Projects is mostly pilings, and we had a discussion about the Wild Pacific Trail as well. So the total of the three slides is $9 million. Does anybody have any questions about those line items that maybe didn't have a slide associated with it? Councillor Hoare? I'm just confirming the Tugwell Fields rec facility. That's the hard sport one that we've talked about in the past. Yeah. Okay. All right. Next 
slide. Okay, so I'm just I'm just bringing these these two slides forward. These are from a year ago, um, February 2022, that Mr. McIntosh presented to uh, council last year. Um, I just want to keep moving it forward. So um, this uh, this was a capital renewal need to replace assets at their at the end of their estimated useful end of life. Um, it was it was very very draft in form. Um, but it, it does show that we need a we have a, quite a backlog of um, assets that have, have already reached their useful end of life. Um, and that slide itself is uh, showing a replacement value of eighty two million dollars. <laughs> and then the next slide shows um, some growth estimates and some of the things that were in our five year plan. So. Um, as we work towards our capital asset plan, it, it, again, it just demonstrates the need that we have to start moving towards putting uh, money into reserves on a regular basis so we can afford to pay for some of these things. I'm going to end this on a, pro a pro you know positive note, I promise. <laughs> okay, next slide. Okay, so in regards to financial modeling again. So this was our set of reserves that we had at the end of 2021. So in the previous years, the district didn't even show this in their financial statements, in their audited statements. So um, it was just lumped together in a big pot and I had to try and figure it out, but um, I asked the auditors to to put it in. So it's, it's very transparent list of reserves with the total at the bottom. So it's easy to see and read. So since then, council uh, adopted the reserves and surplus policy and the uh, reserves and surplus bylaw 1317-2022. And that provides me with some sort of framework to contribute into uh, reserve funds uh, through our five-year plan with council's input and direction with a long-term capital uh, plan in mind. Next slide. And my apologies, you'll probably have to read these ones on your iPad, but... Um, in our new bylaw, we've, we've, um, oh, wrong page, hang on one second here. So this is, this is a slide that shows our new reserves under the new bylaw. So what I've done is uh, collapse the couple of uh, recreation reserve accounts that I was asked to do, and we've deleted some and added others. And I've included the 2022 opening balances with the 2022 estimated closing balances because we had some transfers throughout the year. And then I've, I've added a column in there for what our minimum targets were within the policy. We're still going through year end, so what... I'm doing is taking uh, what's called our unrestricted surplus, that big pot that everybody thinks that we have, um, taking that, leaving the emergency ap amount of money um, in that pot, and then I'm redirecting funds into the bottom three on that slide, the general sewer and capital. So by the end of the year, the general capital should have about $3 million in it. The sewer capital, um, that's, a, that's a little disturbing to me as well. We've only got a quarter of a million dollars in there, and you just heard Mr. McIntosh talk about the lift stations. So that's just one portion of our sewer assets. If we have to replace a sewer lift station, it's probably upwards of half a million dollars. So we're going to be looking at our sewer fees bylaw as well because we need to um, look at sewer as its own program Right now, with the with the metering that we do, f for whatever reason, the water meter rates for sewer is 75% of water rates. And um, I don't really think that that's the way to go. I think that each program needs to be looked at independently of each other um, and compare it to the infrastructure that we need. So if I were to look at something second from the top, say the equipment reserves, you can see we have a whopping $12,000 in that account. If we had regular contributions to these reserve funds through the five-year financial plan, if, if parks or public works needs a truck, I would normally 
I should be able to take it out of there. I shouldn't have to come and ask for a tax requisition to be added to pay for a pickup truck. So that that's the target that we're looking for. That's the financial modeling that I'm talking about is moving towards and building up those reserve funds to pay for the things we need so that the the taxes can then become consistent. It's not like, you know, really high for two years and then really low for one. We want it, we want it a little more consistent. Um, and that's also why I keep, you know, keep bringing up things like alternative revenue sources, <laughs> like parking, um, and finding a way to uh, redirect tourism dollars into uh, the municipality getting to keep some of it because, um, you're right, we, we attract a lot of tourists uh, in a year and they use a lot of our infrastructure and we're not getting any of the money to help uh, pay or replace that. So it's, um, it's a conversation to be had for sure. What's on the next slide? Oh, this, this, uh, the last slide, this slide here with the reserve funds, these these reserves are they don't really have minimum targets per se because they receive money in very direct ways it's not something that we do through tax requisitions so for example dccs we're redoing our bylaw this year um the contributions into the dcc reserves depends on development for example so and then parkland parking spaces land sale they only have contributions if if we sell some land and we make a profit, it has to go into the land sale reserve and that kind of thing. So it's very dependent on the situation. Gas tax, uh, they tell us what we're getting. So there is no target. Small craft harbor, again, we it's self-sustaining. So we, we whatever we have left over at the end of the year is what we put in the reserve. Um, affordable housing could have a could have a minimum target. Um, if we wanted to, um, lucky though, we have about $200,000 this year from our OAP program. So it's going to have yearly contributions and Barclay Commun community forest is also, um, it was really top heavy when it first happened, when, uh, all the cuts were happening, but, um, you know what we get, what we get depending on what kind of work Barclay's doing. So, um, we don't have a minimum target for that either. So I, you know, I said I wouldn't end this on a negative note. I'm going to try and keep it positive here because we, we've actually, believe it or not, made a lot of progress in the last four years um, in the financial world. So we have adopted our reserves and surplus policy. We have adopted the reserves and surplus establishment bylaw. Um, we have now adopted and reestablished old and new reserve funds. Um, this throughout the year end that we're doing right now we're going to be making our initial contributions from to the reserves from our unrestricted surplus so that it doesn't just look like a big pot um, we've reinvested funds to take advantage of higher interest rates so that's in the community charter how we invest funds and we're refining the 2023 core budget so if we can get the core budget balanced that's that goes a long way. So we've we've done a lot of good work over the last four years. Um, it's baby steps, but we are we are getting there. Mm, one more slide. <laughs> so the next steps in our air budget process, uh, February twenty third, we have a special budget meeting. That's the full uh, five year financial plan. So we'll be talking a lot about taxation, what that requisition, uh, where it lands, um, any changes that you might want to make because of it. Um, you you may be very comfortable with with um, all the information that comes before you in February, and it might be perfectly perfectly fine. Or you you may feel that uh, whatever you want to add a bylaw officer or delete some temporary staff or whatever. So. You would, you would direct me to move this way or that way at the end of that meeting. And then on the Monday, February 27th to March 27th, we have a full month of official um, public feedback period. We, of course, accept feedback anytime, but officially speaking, it's, it's during that month. And then in April, we do have another meeting. I think it's on the 13th of April. Um, 
we'll look at the revised role and see how that affects us. Hopefully it's positively this time. And um, then you'll direct me to do the, the uh, two bylaws uh, to come back on May the 9th and then adopt the, the meeting after that, but before Mar uh, May 15th. Any questions? Not seeing any. Uh, I have one quick question through the merit, the public feedback period. Is this just, uh, just something that, you know, the words put out and we solicit feedback or is there an option or an opportunity to try to solicit specific feedback in terms of like how citizens would want to prioritize different you know budget allocations like mm -hmm. how, how much information can we realistically try to collect from people moving forward yeah that's a great question um when i first got here we were doing um uh, we did a public meeting in one of the activity rooms with all the sign boards um it's it seemed to be that people would come to talk mostly about projects so that was always good and then right after that covid hit so we were actually just talking uh, about that on monday whether or not maybe uh, we would like to do um, some sort of in-person um, tour if you will uh, to try and get some feedback um, we could do it um, in conjunction sam mccullough over there she could give us a hand on <laughs> <laughs> She's hiding behind the monitor over there. Um, we could do something like that again. I think it's a fairly safe environment to do that. Um, I know other communities are, are using things like bang the table and social media. Um, we haven't gotten to the place where we're using uh, bang the table platforms, but it would be nice to do something in person. And we're open to any thoughts that, that this council has and we'll just make it happen. I agree it would be great to have an open house again like we did before and open up the community rooms there. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Anything further from either of you? Go ahead. <laughs> I like I like the mic. <laughs> um I I just want to thank uh, Ms. Monteith for, for putting this together. It was a, a definitely a challenging uh, budget to balance this year. Um, there's a lot of competing interests, especially with our, our capital projects, um, and just the um, increased um, CPI that we're experiencing. That's having a, a, a significant effect on the budget. Um, and uh, uh, also a thank you to all our staff. Um, we did go through it with a fine-tooth comb to make sure that we're only expending what we need to in a time where we're seeing exceptional increases in costs. So there's there's very little wiggle room and I think uh, Ms. Monteith uh, captured it a couple of times is that there's n there's not much wiggle room within this budget. So the one thing that does make us a little uncomfortable, um, although we're okay, is that there is no wiggle room. So if anything goes sideways, we will be back. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it, it's something that we, we like a little bit of padding, right? Uh, but we don't want to overdo it. This time we went on the cons uh, on on the conservative side for that, to realizing that uh, too high of a uh, a request for tax uh, new tax dollars um, is is not realistic uh, with the expenditures that we have on the list. Um, a lot of those are tied to grants, right? So we're we're getting high value for the dollars that we are using. Um, and then the last part of it is um, with respect to our reserves and, and we're, we're really excited to have the new reserves bylaw in place and the allocating those unrestricted uh, surplus funds uh, which help um, balance those uh, reserve portfolios. But the one key thing to understand as well is those portfolios, they, they are funded through taxation. So we have to look at a way moving forward with council and you will be hearing back from staff on strategies on how we can start contributing uh, in a positive manner to those reserves on a regular basis um, through diligent use of our our, our user f our, our fee structures um, and any other sources of revenues that we can find so once we have annual contributions to those reserves like the equipment reserve twelve thousand dollars you know that bar 
buys you four tires, uh, unfortunately. Um, so uh, there's a long way to go in our equipment that we're we're going to have to move forward with. So uh, understand that we will be coming back um, in the years to come with additional strategies to help uh, balance those reserve contributions moving forward um, and, and not do it through just, hey, we have to raise the property tax. So um, I think we're we're in in looking very good uh, for this year. Um, the tax rates that Dunn doesn't want to talk about right now because she doesn't know what they are. <laughs> um, even though I tried to get her to do it, um, it, it's that'll be coming in February, and that's that's when council will see um, where we actually landed. Um, and again, as as Miss Monteith uh, indicated, if there is key priorities uh, that council wants to to see come back by law enforcement, um, the parks that we cut, um, additional uh, positions in that, uh, they are really critical for us. Uh, we, we do not uh, delay those without a deep thing or thinking about it very strategically. Um, w would they be valuable moving forward now? Uh, absolutely. But we think we can manage without them for one more year. But um, we'll, we'll be uh, happy to hear from council as to, to the direction that you would like to go with those or any other items that uh, that uh, council's council would like us to consider moving forward. So thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much to our team, Donna, for doing all this hard work. I've uh, still got a lot to go <laughs> another month or two um so um if council has any additional questions um we'd be happy to answer them thank you is uh, the slide deck on our ipad it will be it will be okay great thank you <laughs> any other questions no okay i will uh the special council meeting is adjourned at seven twenty-six, and thank you staff for being here